this MacArthur over the session uh, is because of this, uh, the Gary MacArthur Fellowship Program in memory of uh, physicist, uh, our fellow uh, physicist, uh, Gary MacArthur, who provides the scientific leadership for the field of light con physics. Uh, some of uh, us uh, remember him very well. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, we will uh, have uh, some kind of uh, uh, award uh, celebration session in the banquet uh, tomorrow uh, evening. And uh, James will lead us uh, for, the, for that uh, banquet ceremony. But today is kind of more uh, formal uh, physics session. So this program was established in 2008. Uh, the history of this LightCon meeting goes back in 1991 in Heidelberg. So we have so far 40 and the plus one here in Rio. And during that period, uh, we were able to award many young physicists. Some of them are already here and they're making some leading roles <laughs> in the physics uh, and so on. So uh, this year we have uh, three awardees, three new awardees. So included then we have uh, 51 awardees. And uh, it's incredible that uh, these awardees actually playing the major roles. Uh, uh, one example was uh, uh, 2018 uh, in, in Paris. I think we had Cedric Lose organized uh, the LightCon meeting before pandemic. But then I think you will see more uh, in the coming year. Uh, Zingbo Zhao is here. He is going to organize. He was a recipient and he has a few other recipients working together. So it's quite incredible. So this year, uh, we're very pleased to have uh, this three new awardees, uh, Siki Zhu. Uh, and uh, he's uh, was uh, his supervisor was Singbo Zhao, and Herb uh, Deuterius. Uh, his supervisor is Herb Mutade, and Bim Sehan Kuzar uh, is he here. All three of them here, and uh, Kuzar's uh, supervisor is Dipanka Chakrabati. So. I think we will just uh, have uh, the three talks this morning. So uh, perhaps I will start from her, her uh, the trio to see here. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. Thank you very much. I would like to say that I'm very honored to receive this award in memory of Gary McCartor. So I would like to thank, of course, the International Light Con Advisory Committee, the organizing committee here also for the very, very nice conference. I don't know if you have my slides. Uh... Yeah. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes. So, uh, and maybe do I have this thing? And yes, great. Um, yeah. So, so as uh, Changji has said, I, I've done my uh, PhD uh, under the supervision of Hervé Moutard at uh, Saclay. Uh, so with Cédric, Valerio, Pavel, and Warsaw, so the people from the Portens group. Uh, and uh, so I did the PhD mostly in the phenomenology of GPDs from experimental process, and especially from DVCS. Uh, and I've decided to change optics for a postdoc because uh, for about six months, I've been working at William & Mary in the US, and I'm uh, working in Lattice QCD now and trying to extract Borton distribution on the lattice. Um, and at first, I wanted to try to talk about both aspects in this uh, in this presentation, uh, because I believe they are truly complementary and for GPDs, which are a very serious matters on extracting them in a data driven approach. I believe that we gonna have to scrape the barrel with everything we we can in order to 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 have a, a nice data driven extraction of those, and we will be need to use both of them. But then I reflected about the session we had yesterday, with many talks about the pro gravitational form factors, uh, and many references, for instance, to this uh, very nice Nature paper. 2018 by J Lab Burkhardt and, and and his collaborators, uh, and I would like to uh, maybe reshot on the fly with respect to what has been uh, discussed uh, and the questions and interactions of, of yesterday. And so maybe I will start with my conclusions first, like three points I would like to convey, and maybe you would not agree with all of them, but uh, I think it's interesting to have a discussion on this. The first thing is this study uh, in 2018 is, in my opinion, a theoretical model with a few free parameters that have been fitted to experimental data. And that is very important. It is not, in my opinion, a data-driven analysis. Many of the uncertainty of the study are due to theoretical assumptions that have been made and that are common to a lot of the work that many people have been presenting as well. So when you compare your theoretical model to that paper, you're really comparing it to mostly another theoretical paper and not really to experimental data. So when you observe a lot of similarities, it is good to ask, are those similarities because we use the same modeling ingredients more than because data truly tells me that this is what is in nature? Because in the end, nature tells us not that much at this stage unfortunately, about all of these matters. So that's my first point. Be a bit careful on what exactly, where does the agreement come from? The second point is, if this is not a data-driven study, can we do data-driven studies? And yes, we can try, but the result is pretty horrendous, as I'm going to try to show you. As you keep subtracting modeling ingredients, your uncertainty explodes to the point that uh, you might wonder, can we actually do anything at all? And I think we have put words and, and precise concepts on this uncertainty through the concept of shadow GPDs that we have introduced during my PhD uh, in order to be able to have a quantitative discussion about this and really have something that we, we can focus on and not just have generic arguments of, yeah, DVCS gives you an access to GPDs. That is true, but what kind of access do you have? Not that great. And so there has been a lot of uh, discussions in recent years to find new exclusive processes with an enhanced sensitivity to GPDs. That's very interesting, and I would try to, to talk about this. So, But my second point is, if you really want to do data-driven analysis of GPDs, you're going to need an awful lot of processes, an awful lot of work, and it is far more complicated than what has been done, for instance, for unpolarized PDFs. And if you have the picture of unpolarized PDF and you apply it to GPDs, you, you, you're missing a big part of the complexity of the picture, in my opinion. And the third thing is Lattice QCD. Of course, it's been about 10 years since Jianlongji has introduced his non-local uh, techniques, uh, operator techniques to study pollen distributions on the lattice. Maybe five or six years that it's being done intensively for unpolarized pollen distributions. And then there's a question because on the lattice, uh, lattice is a problem that scales very poorly once you start to reach fine lattices and large momenta. And the question is, do we have a systematically improvable framework for lattice, or are we hitting a, a, a wall of noise 
So that essentially is a study you see right now on unpolarized PDFs are close to being the best that we can do on the lattice. That's also an interesting question. And if you want to go beyond what is being done right now, I think you have to be pretty imaginative. That was my third part. Not clear whether I'm going to be able to talk about all of this in this uh, short presentation. So uh, I'm going to skip. As I said, I'm going to change my presentation mostly. I'm going to go directly to this question of this, uh, how do we extract from experimental data right now a gravitational form factor? And of course, the uh, idea relies on the fact that deeply virtual Compton scattering can be factorized in the limit of small so this is small t factorization, small t over q square, uh, and the Bjorken limits. You can parameterize DVCS in terms of Lorentz structure functions, which we call Compton form factors. And then at twist two, you can write this traditional convolution. So your Compton form factor here, which is something you extract from the experimental data, can be written as a convolution of your part and distribution and a perturbatively computable coefficient function. So already at this stage, it's pretty difficult. There's a lot of mess already at this stage. Uh, for instance, xi that you see here is not an experimental variable. How do you relate that to anything you've extracted from DVCS? So of course it is related to Bjork next, but uh, there is kind of an ambiguity there because in the end, what is longitudinal and what is transverse when your proton has changed direction over the course of your interaction, if you want. And, and to, to some extent, this change of direction is linked to t over q square, which means that you will find different formalisms in order to study DVCS, where the value of xi, which is supposed to represent the transfer of, of plus momentum uh, between in your in your DVCS problem. Maybe I should I should show this <laughs> before. Uh, so this is okay. So DVCS, what is it? You get a proton or whatever hadron you have there, and you get an electron coming here, and then the electron leaves the game, and you produce a real photon, right? And so this is a picture I borrowed from a paper by uh, Jan Wei Xu and, and Zai Yu. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a very nice picture of factorization and why factorization holds in the small t factorization. Because the idea is that t, which is the uh, for momentum transfer on your hadron, is also the virtuality of this object that you are probing inside the proton. And Q square is the large virtuality that flows in the hard part of your interaction. And then having T much smaller than Q square means that the lifetime of this thing you are probing in your proton is much longer than the lifetime of the interaction there. And why is that important? Because it kills all the soft gluon radiation that would occur everywhere and that would completely mess up with your, with your factorization. That's a, just a very basic intuitive picture of why this works in the uh, factorization works in this formalism. And then the question is, what exactly are you probing inside your proton? Uh, and you want to form a, a color singlet object that can fly away for a long lifetime in order to be separated from the soft gluons. The first thing you can have is just a photon. And so that for DVCS is beta Heitler. And so it's interesting because we usually think of beta Heitler as a contamination of DVCS. But when you look at like that, it's just a leading power of, DVC, of, of the electro production of a real photon. Uh, and then, of course, you had the process we're interested in a couple of quarks, a couple of gluons, and then you have higher twists where you exchange more and more uh, partons with, with, your, with, your, uh, with your proton. Uh, and right, so, and so xi is supposed to be the transfer that occurs on the light cone of form momentum. To your active proton and so to your to your proton as well uh, but in terms of experimental data as i said you have different conventions and of course the final results cannot depend on arbitrary conventions which means that you will report all of these uncertainties into uh, power corrections and so how to deal with this kinematical higher twist and so on the force is a subject of still yet today a, a lot of discussions uh, with a, a pretty confusing status of the literature to be honest uh, of course there's a question also how do you do the flavor decomposition and there you have to uh, use different targets it's a very nice demonstration 2020 uh, with neural network analysis so relatively model independent analysis that when combining neutron and proton dvcs you can achieve a, a separation of flavor so that's very nice but a very basic comment I would like to make is that in order to describe DVCS in the leading twist, which is already a pretty uh, restrictive framework, you have four chiral even GPDs. If you want to have U, D, U bar, D bar, and gluons, so a pretty minimal set of flavors, you have 20 GPDs. 
each of them are objects with three dimensions. It means that even with the most simplistic dumb parameterization of GPDs, you have hundreds of parameters to fit, and that is really a dumb model, and you already have hundreds of parameters. So of course, we have a pretty big numerical problem. But I won't even be talking about any of those. I will assume we managed to do the flavor decomposition, and we'll assume we don't have any kind of uncertainties, power corrections, all of that. I just want to focus, assume that you have extracted this quantity with its flavor dependence perfectly well from the data. How well are you able to now go to the GPD, even when you're past all of these technical problems? So let's start with gravitational form factors. Question is really, how do you extract a gravitational form factor from DVCS in the standard procedure, the one that has been used in this nature paper? Uh, you start with a, a dispersive framework for DVCS. So you study the analytical properties of these uh, Compton form factors, and you derive that provided the imaginary part has some type of power behavior at small xi, you can write this relation here where you relate the real part with what is in fact the Hilbert transform of the imaginary part. And notice that it's an integral from zero to one. You, If you want to apply this framework, you need to be able to quantify imaginary part from zero to one. That is not possible. That is simply not possible because you have kinematic limits on the values that psi can reach for a given value of t, and you cannot at fix t, the same t everywhere here, reach psi equal one in ordinary frameworks uh, in, 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 uh, for kinematical reasons in your experimental data. So it means you cannot collect data from zero to one. So a big part of this integral in these fits to data is going to be completely model dependent. But also you could in theory reach psi goes to zero, but the JLab data that has been taken is taken as fairly large psi right now. It's uh, say 0 0.1, something like that, maybe a bit smaller than that, is what you, what you typically go as lowest value of psi. So you will need to model the large part and the small part of the integral. And that is where the biggest part of model dependence, in my opinion, enters the game, how you do that. Because what has been done in this nature paper is used a uh, parameterization with, you put VG behavior, you put all the physics you know in the hope of reducing, of, of being able to extrapolate this integral. We have done a similar study with the opposite approach. We want to put the less possible model assumptions and we want to try to extract the most of the data. So we use new neural networks parameterizations for to fit this guy to the data where it exists and to try to introduce less bias where it does not exist. But of course, neural networks, as we uh, familiar with, uh, have uncertainties that explodes in the region where you don't have data. So in the end, you will see the result is pretty striking. Well, so we have this pretty big problem here that we requires a lot of model dependence, although you're trying to, to do an experimental extraction. Then, provided you have the correct power behavior of the imaginary part, you this thing does not depend on psi. We call that a subtraction constant. It's constant because it does not depend on psi. And then, that's where perturbative QCD enters the game because you choose then to work at a perturbative order. And so what was done in, in the nature paper was, was leading order. And then at leading order, you show that this subtraction constant is related to some function D and you're still not out of the woods yet because what you're interested in is a gravitational form factor C, which is related to this function D by another integral. And so you have another problem, yes. If you assume you manage to extract from the experimental data this integral, how do you get to this integral, another one? And so the answer is, in theory, you know how your object depends on scale, right? You know that the D term here evolves uh, at, uh, following the ERBL equation. Uh, so that means that at leading order, you can make an expansion in conformal moments and each conformal moment has a dependence in mu square that is given by an anomalous dimension, a different one that you can compute from the ERBL equation. And so now that you have expanded in terms of conformal moments, you realize that what you extract from the data is the sum of all conformal moments, and what you're truly interested in is just the first conformal moment. And then if indeed every conformal moment has a different multiplicative dependence in mu square, if you measure well enough on a wide enough range of scales, this subtraction constant, you might be able to extract just D1 from the sum of the ends. Okay, uh, spoiler alert, it doesn't work. But before we <laughs> show that it doesn't really work, 
And that's why the title of this talk is a bit ironic because evolution is supposed to give you this handle, but in fact, it doesn't work that well. Before we, we deal with that, there's one thing I've not told about here. It's T dependence. And of course we have T dependence here. And so what many models do is assume a multiple NZ for the T dependence. And I'd like to make a comment on that because this is this is a, a, a plot I took from uh, this 2018 paper by the MIT lattice group. This is the first time the gluonic gravitational form factors were computed on the lattice. And so these two plots are exactly the same lattice data analyzed with a different T dependence. On the left, you have a tripole fit and you see this type of profile we've been seeing a lot yesterday with this repulsive core and attractive uh, region outside. And okay, this is very nice, very low uncertainty. You're very happy. You analyze the same data, but you use in terms of T-dependence what they call the Z expansion. So that's a flexible parameterization of T-dependence where you add more and more terms in order to increase the flexibility. And suddenly the situation is pretty different. Look at the quark content. So now the quark content because you are more flexible, can exhibit, for instance, several oscillations. You could have a repulsive, attractive, repulsive, attractive region, for instance. And that is the same data. So, so you see that the T dependence you put, of course, when once you've chosen the functional T dependence, then your radial profile is just a Fourier transform of the T dependence. If you choose a multiple, you're going to obtain this shape. But that's because you have chosen the multiple T dependence. That's not because nature uh, tells you that it is the case. Nature tells you in the end much less than what you would hope it to tell you. Let's put that problem aside, although I think it's a pretty important problem uh, there, and, and go back to what the, the result of the fits to the data. So here, this point here with this nice narrow uncertainty is a result of the Nature 2018 paper. The result of our study is the green band. The result of another study that was published in Nature in 2019 is uh, this, this uncertainty here. So both the red and the green results have been obtained using neural networks to parameterize this uh, missing part of the integral I've been mentioning before. Whereas this Nature paper has used uh, experimentalization to do that. It makes an enormous difference, as you can see. And uh, now, if, for instance, in, the, in this uh, Kumarisky paper, uh, you obtain D1 that is actually slightly positive. I mean, it's mostly compatible with zero, but it's even slightly positive, which of course, with all the, D, the, the, the talks we had about the stability that requires D1 negative, well, that's very unfortunate. But our result is also that uh, within the current state of data, if you don't put these modeling assumptions on how to extend the imaging part, you're compatible with zero, you're compatible with 10 times the pressure in the neutron star, you're compatible with everything you want because your data is not precise enough. This is not even the biggest problem. I've told you that uh, you, you, you need to have this expansion in conformal moments if you want to, to, to separate uh, these, uh, to, to go from one integral to the other. But I've not given any details on how I handle the infinite number of conformal moments and so on and so forth. How do I do that here? Well, I just cut the expansion to just its first term. I just assumed that all terms dn are zero except the first one. This is how these plots were obtained. So in the nature paper, they argue that they try to evaluate what is the systematic uncertainty of performing this, uh, this truncation by studying a quark soliton model. And they see that in this model, the, uh, the, the conformal moments decrease very quickly. Uh, essentially, it's, every new moment is three times less than the previous one. And so they added a blanket uncertainty of 30 or 40 percent to their results, saying this will account for the systematic uncertainty of the truncation. Well, what we try to do is say, well, what about we actually include an explicit free D3 parameter in our study? And so our previous result, the one I showed before, the green band was this. Now, if you include a D3 free parameter, the result is your uncertainty multiplied by 20. And now D1 equal minus D3, essentially perfect correlation. What's going on? Uh, well, I remind you that what you extract from the data is this integral, which is the sum of dNs. Of course, if D1 equal minus D3, it gives no contribution to the data. You cannot constrain this kind of modes using your data. But then you're going to tell me, hey, but wasn't the whole deal the fact that every dn terms varies with a different anomalous dimension? So d1 cannot be equal to d3, because that, that can be true at one scale. But when you evolve, it's no longer true. And you're right, that, that's the whole idea. But the question is, how 
quick is evolution, how different does D1 and D3 behave in their evolution so that you can meaningfully separate them? And that is a problem. Evolution, as we kind of know, is pretty weak as soon as you're away from the Lando pole where, where you have a spurious divergence. It's a log of log of Q squared, essentially, the evolution effect. So what happens is that here I've shown you the gamma gamma nqq. It's, it's what evolves you uh, the uh, dn term. And so you see that gamma one and gamma three, if I, so these are the evolution operators. If I represent them on a range of evolution from one to 10 GV square, well, they're not that different at all. Uh, and so you can show that a generic estimate of the uncertainty is one minus the ratio of those two guys evaluated on the furthest available range of experimental data to the power minus one. So the more gamma one is close to gamma three, the more divergent this thing is, you cannot separate the two terms D1 and D3. And so if with, with this uh, back of the envelope estimate, you can even e evaluate what would be the impact of the EIC. If you increase your range from 1.5 to four, which is more or less what is available right now with JLab 6 GeV data to 1.5 to 50, well, this ratio is divided by three. That's great. That's a three times improvement with the sole effect of having a larger range in, 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 uh, in Q square. The problem is that when your uncertainty was uh, 20 here, if you divide it by three, that's still eight, and that's still very big. Uh, um, unfortunately, even with an EIC, it would be much better, of course, but it would not be enough using DVCS alone to make a model independent extraction of this kind of qualities. And so, okay, that's about gravitational form factors. Let me check. check. Okay, I talk a lot. Uh, that's just about the gravitational form factors. Now, if I take the full GPD, I want to extract a full GPD. I'm really trying to know whether I can extract H if I know this convolution here. And so we did the same kind of, of, of thing. So you remember D1 equal minus D3 is a mode that we call a shadow mode because it's something that you cannot constrain from the data because it essentially gives us zero contribution at one scale and a very tiny contribution under evolution. So you cannot constrain this kind of objects from your data. So what we did is trying to find similar data, similar objects that we call shadow GPDs that we likewise cannot constrain with a full content form factor convolution. And so here is an example of three curves. You see the orange, the brown, and the blue, and all these three curves gives exactly rigorously the same content form factor at next to leading order at one scale, which is whatever you choose. And then you evolve it, and we evolved it from one to 100 GeV square. And then the content form factor it gives is 10 to the minus five. It needs, you need to measure data at 10 to the minus five precision from one to 100 GV square in order to be able to make the difference between these three curves using just DVCS data. So that tells you how DVCS data is poorly constraining and how evolution effects in the end, well, they're not that strong at all. Uh, you might say there are large fluctuations and large X in my models here, and that is absurd. We know that it should not happen like this. So maybe DVCS is not enough to rule out these curves, but I can rule them out for another criterion, which is that they are unphysical as they sound like this. And you would be very right to make that comment. So we've tried to use more a more flexible approach because all of this was do, done with, with uh, some complicated polynomial uh, analytical fits to guarantee that you really had zero uh, contribution to the content form factor. But in the end, it doesn't really matter that we have zero contribution. We just want it to be smaller than the noise. So we can use a numerical approach. We've tried to experience with neural networks. So of course you have a lot of symmetries to satisfy in, in your GPDs. Uh, so, so we uh, had to use a fairly complicated form of the neural networks. We added three of them together. Okay, I don't have much time to go into details. In order to kill these fluctuations at large X, what we wanted to do is to implement these positivity conditions because it enforces very, uh, it enforces drastic conditions, exclusion zones when X is larger than psi. Um, and so that gives you immediately your, your, your killing the, these fluctuations. And so here is one of the results we obtain on what is more a proof of concept. This is not a fit to actual data. What we did is we take the JK model, we take the DVCS observable of JK model, we fit our model to the JK observables, so not to true uh, data. And then uh, this is a kind of uncertainty. As you see, uncertainty has been pushed entirely to the region where x is smaller than size. This is for psi called 0.5, because this 
relation is very constraining when x is larger than psi. Of course, you may say, do we want to introduce positivity? There's been some debates recently, I mean, for a long time, about positivity is violated by renormalization. So at low scale, you don't really expect positivity to be respected, to be observed. Now, I think in the current stage, it's still, it's, it's, it's a better than nothing. And it's not a completely fantasy criterion to apply. Okay, how can we do better than DVCS? The problem of DVCS, if we go deep down at the core, this is your DVCS. You've got your electron coming in, coming out. you got your object that you're probing inside your proton. you got your high virtuality photon, and then you emit a real photon there. So the hard momentum flows in this virtual photon, and it flows in this quark line. You can express, this is taken from this paper from John Wei and, and collaborator, you can express the virtuality of this quark line in this manner here. If you, if Q2, if this is a real photon, of course, Q2 square equals zero. And what you notice is that you entirely factorize the dependence between the hard scale and the X and Psi scale. So that's a big issue with DVCS. That's essentially what explains why the coefficient function of DVCS only depends on Q square through alpha S of Q square. You only have uh, the effect of uh, renormalization that makes your dependence on scale, but you have no entanglement between X and Q square at any deeper level than just correction brought by perturbative QCD. So in order to find the, uh, a process that is much more sensitive to GPDs, we would like to entangle the Q square and the X dependence. Of course, a way to do it is to not work in the limit where Q square, Q2 square equals zero. If Q2 square is now not negligible compared to Q square, well, you do have an entanglement between the X and Xi, as you can see here. And the regime is a, is a, is a process where Q2 here is a virtual photon is known as double DVCS. And double DVCS now provides you two hard scales. And okay, now you have an entanglement with X and Xi. Of course, the problem is then your, your virtual photon decays into a pair of leptons. And so it's much more difficult to measure and your cross-section drops a bit and so on. Suppose. I'm not an experimentalist that I'm overextending myself on this, but my understanding is that it's a process that is of course more difficult to measure. Uh, if you want to still have a process where you, 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 you just produce just a two to three process, right? So you just have your incoming hard probe and your proton and you just produce uh, two particles, so it's three, yeah, two, two particles in final state. An interesting proposal is a photo production of a photon meson pair. So here you got your object that you're probing inside your proton. Here you got your incoming photon of, of, of the photon production, and then you produce a meson and you produce another photon in the final state. What is interesting, what you can show is now that the hard momentum flows inside this pass here and therefore becomes entangled really with the X dependence of your, uh, your GPD and also with the Z dependence of your distribution amplitude, which of course is, is a problem every time you put a meson in these things, you add a new per non perturbative object. But now you really, and, and what Janway and his collaborators showed is that using the formalism shadow GPDs, they took these shadow GPDs we exhibited for DVCS and they showed that this kind of process can actually give you a, a nice discrimination between them because now the effect of Q square dependence is not just a perturbative QCD evolution, but it's really entangled to the X and Z dependencies. Right. Uh, what about, okay, I just have a very short amount of time to talk about lattice QCD. Okay. Uh, so on the lattice, as you all know, we're working on the Euclidean metric because we don't like uh, exponential I uh, uh, integrals that oscillate like crazy. So we like to have complex time, which transforms all our oscillating integrals into exponentially suppressed integrals. And so we, we use the same matrix element as uh, you would do in on the light cone, except we now have a space-like separation between our fields. And so what is really interesting is that this space like, okay, look at what we're doing really. We're creating a proton. We are destroying it later on on our lattice. And at some point in the life of our proton, we are introducing this operator psi by psi with a physical separation Z in it. And of course, if Z is too big, you start to see this is a QCD vacuum on the bottom and you start to interact with a QCD vacuum, you have a whole bunch of problems. This thing was told by Jamal yesterday. Well, you, a partonic 
interpretation of the cancer of the proton is not really relevant when z is larger. So we have to keep small values of z, but then z square acts as a regulator of collinear divergences in this object. And it's easy to understand. It's, it's, it's a Wilsonian renormalization. You're really probing the structure of your proton at some physical resolution. So it means that the evolution of this operator in Z when Z is space-like really gives you a non-perturbative view of evolution because Z acts exactly as a factorization scale, except it's another scheme. And so here I show you a few matrix elements computed on the lattice. So they are expressed in this function of Yoffa time, which is a Fourier conjugate date of the X dependence. And it's Z equal uh, 0 0.3 Fermi is a blue, 0 0.2 Fermi is a red. And so here you can see that there's here a non perturbative effect of evolution. And what I did is trying to extract an evolution operator from this data before. I show you quickly the result. This is gray band is the evolution operator I extracted from the lattice QCD I just showed you before. And then the all the colored bands are perturbative inputs. So the blue is just leading log MS bar evolution. The uh, orange is next to leading log. The green is leading log plus the matching to put you in this weird scheme in which we are working on because we're not working in MS bar. And the uh, red shaded area is next to leading log plus the smearing. And what do I want to say with this plot? Well, that's uh, what you extract from the lattice is compatible with <laughs> essentially many of the perturbative inputs you use. The problem is that our data is fairly indulgent in the current state. You can do many different perturbative treatments of that, and it is consistent. You are able to fit the data with various strategies. So we really need to ramp up the precision if we want to be able to say anything that is not just, okay, it's compatible with whatever perturbative treatment you want to apply to this data. And how to do that? I don't think I have time to tell about it, right? <laughs> okay. Come on, thank you. Very generous. <laughs> so, uh, okay, the idea we're exploring right now uh, at William and Mary J Lab is the idea of going to, part, uh, to small volume lattices. So, what is typically you see this is everything is on scale on this uh, on this slide. So, this is a happy little proton, zero point eight Fermi of size or whatever, and you want to put it in a box that is big enough so that it can uh, wiggle a bit and not uh, overlap with itself because every time it hits a boundary, it just uh, reappear on the other side. So you, you you like to work in lattices that are five per me or so of size, and then you consider that you have a good handle on your finite volume effects. The problem is that, as I said, you need to have a small physical separation Z if you want to have a protein interpretation of your matrix element. And then the Yoffa time, the, the range in Fourier transform where you can access your your uh, uh, proton distribution depends on the momentum you have. You need to boost more and more your proton in order to get a, a better handle at the a larger kinematic region to extract your PDF. And the problem is that boosting your hadron requires having finer and finer lattices. And if you keep a big lattice and you make it finer and finer, it has more and more points in it. And at the end, you just are unable to compute this. It's, it's called a critical slowing down problem and it scales horrendously. So our good idea is, and it's not the first time at all that this has been proposed, is to, to go to smaller volumes while keeping the same number of points. So you can have a finer lattice and higher momenta, but the problem is now your lattice is much smaller than your proton. So it's great. Every time you divide by two the size of your lattice, you get an, an increased kinematic range by a factor two. But the problem is that in this small volume, what you compute is not a hadronic matrix element. Hadrons do not exist on this small thing. So the whole big deal is, do you are you able to understand the nature of these finite volume effects to, re to compute things with a large kinematic range in this very small lattice and then propagate all these finite volume effects all the way down to the infinite volume limit. That's a big challenge, and that's what we're working on. Thank you. I think it's uh, very important to be very critical in all the bandwagon <laughs> progress people talk about, and uh, very nice. Uh, any, yes, you have a question. I hand it over to you, Tobias. So first of all, indeed, I think uh, it's the first realistic talk up here about GPDs in a long time, what we can really extract from the current data and even what we can extract for the EIC. It will be extremely challenging. Um, but what would be really helpful, so double DVCS, 
yes, if you have luminosities of 10 to the 38, which you will not get in a collider, it's undoable. And TCS has, of course, a problem that if you look to cross sections, there's this huge contribution from beta Heidler, which you cannot uh, separate out. Asymmetries are slightly different. So I think it would be really important from the theory community to work with the experimentalists and work on what can be measured to make progress on the experimental, on the extraction so that you have data which you can do. Because for double DVCS also your uh, kinematic range in X and Q square will be even smaller than what you have for DVCS. So the constraint will be very limited in, in that sense. So I think this would be really nice to have a group looking to this together so that we can have a realistic approach what we can do. Okay, good comment. Uh, I think you were the first <laughs> before him, so that's very quick. Yeah. Um, so uh, you might have heard of hydrodynamics in small systems. I mean, this is what for this to make for hydrodynamics in small systems to make any sense, just on a conceptual level you would need the distribution of the energy momentum tensor, which is TMDs, to be in some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence with the entropy density, which very roughly is related to GPDs. I'm being very rough here, but degrees of freedom is entropy. And it has to be in some kind of one-to-one -one correspondence, which then becomes the equation of state. From your talk, I'm a complete outsider it doesn't even seem to be the case. Is that correct? The TMDs and GPDs are just not related at all in any way that could be a one-to-one -one correspondence, even a, an unde experimentally undetectable one. Thank you. Uh, so they are projections of this Vigno distribution, which is a high dimensional operator. Now, so you, you cannot go from a GPD to a TMD, uh, otherwise we would not be bothering with this <laughs> at all. If it were the same objects in a different form, it, it contains a different information. I think uh, many more questions we can discuss in the coffee break and you have a burning question or? <laughs> Okay. Uh, if you think on this path, if you discretize, for example, bits of Peter amplitude models to compute it, even with simple kernel, to help in understanding this path. Okay. I just. just, just... <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so next talk is uh, Shikiju. Yeah. Okay, all right. So please go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Professor Cheng Yi, and uh, I'm very. It's my honor to get the Michael Gary Makata Award, and uh, and thanks very thanks to Professor Wary and Professor Zhao, uh, support me and trust me. And uh, and uh, and right now I stand here to present my current talk and uh, current work and uh, my talk topic is towards a Hamiltonian first principle approach for barrier. Okay. Oh. And my talk can be separate uh, three part. The first part I make a brief introduction to the to the basis light from the quantization. And for the third part, I will review the history, uh, review the achievement of the BFQ and the, way, what, and the current work. For the third part, we will introduce the, uh, the, we were, we were introduce the future plan for our work. And the, for, for each approach, we need to make a choice that, uh, uh, for example, is a coordinate, we need to select some coordinate and we need to select some like gauge gauge condition and the boundary condition. In our in basic light form quantization, we we are working on the light from the coordinates and we uh, let me say okay. We selected the light cone gauge and in our calculation. At this at this uh, with this choice we consider that we are working on the Hamiltonian formalism. We directly numerically uh, diagonalize the Hamiltonian to solve the eigenvalue equation. 
to uh, use the eigen, after we solve the eigenvalue equation, we can get the eigenstate and the eigenvalue for for each state. The eigenvalue can give can re directly related to the system mass and the eigenstate named the we, or here we name the light front wave function and use this this light front wave function can include the, all the information we which we can, which can help us to study the baryon structure. And for the basic life form composition, this is a numerical numerical approach. So, that, so we need firstly we need to enumerate the basis. When we enumerate the basis for, at the transverse plan, we consider the two-dimensional harmonic oscillator to repl to replace the uh, the moment space. And to use the harmonic oscillator basis, we have a few good uh, advantages. Since that first one is the rotation symmetry can be kept in the transverse plan. And the second sense is we can factorize factorization, directly factorize the central mass motion and the intrinsic motion. And this will be help us to can help us to study the baryon structure and without uh, uh, any central mass motion effect. And the third thing is if we use the harmonic oscillator basis, it's it's clear that we can get some uh, like uh, the IR and the UV regulator, and we it's not uh, the the IR and the UV behavior is can be controlled by the harmonic oscillator. And actually, and uh, uh, similar things is uh, we at, we use the longi discretized longitudinal moment to replace the continuum moment space and. Uh, Except the spatial uh, coordinates, we also need to include the helicity and the color as the, another quantum number in our uh, in our basis. That's a, this uh, all those bases can help us, can give us the enough information to help us to uh, study the the baryon system in QCD. Okay, this is our Hamilton. This is our our Hamiltonian. Our Hamiltonian can directly derive from the QCD Lagrangian and consider that at the light cone gauge we can find that the the we have two kinetic term and the seventh uh, interaction term and the seventh interaction term can lead to uh, the numerous uh, how said numerous uh, so vortex in vortex interaction. And okay, and right now I can make a brief uh, view, brief view of our achievement. For the for the barrier barrier as a QCD system can it must it 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 is comprised of at least three quarks. So we when we study those things, we need uh, we consider firstly we consider us the leading fog sector is a three Q, three quark, and the three quark we study the proton and. The, and uh, and uh, with some like the GPD TMD, we calculate use a light form wave function to calculate those things. And then we we also use this model to calculate the lambda and the lambda c, because we use we only use the leading fog sector. So leading fog sector must be uh, it if we only include uh, leading fog sector, it we cannot uh, generate the interaction between the quark. So we so in here we need to include a three effect interaction. The first, the first, the two interaction is the confined potential in transverse and the longitudinal direction. For the third term is a one blank change. It can generate the spin uh, interaction between the three quarks. And use the use these things, we can directly calculate the uh, barrier system in th in three quark in valence quark uh, in val in terms of valence quark. And this is our some calculate some observable, we can say that uh, uh, what nuclear radius and uh, some like the magnetic moment and axial charge all more or less agree with that uh, agree, uh, extracted data or lattice data. And then we wanted to, yeah. Uh, which one? Neutral, okay. Uh, the, yeah, but as with yeah, you you say this one, right? Yeah, yeah, that's uh, yeah, because that's a neutron is a little bit special. It's a charge charge neutron. Uh, uh, how said it's a no charge particle, right? So when we you know when we 
So when we uh, calculate, calculate these things, we find that uh, if we have some like the, we, if our P wave contribution is a, is a little bit small and the, here it has a big difference in calculation. This is due to the uh, polyform factor contribution a, li a little bit small or here. So that's the reason why we, our result has a uh, charge radius of the neutron has a little bit far away from that the, uh, the experimental data. Yeah, yeah. Large, and with a large error bar, right? And then as we wanted, because we are using the effect interaction. So the effect interaction is, uh, is not we wanted to do that uh, next step. So we are, we are trying to ex extend that, expanding the in the Fox space. And as we include the QQQG, we can directly use, we can directly use the, the QCD vortex as a Q to QG, uh, quark gluon vortex and the instantaneous gluon vortex to replace the one gluon exchange and change. But we, because of the Fox sector limitation, so we still need some like uh, transverse and the longitudinal confined potential in our calculation. And then we, and then we use this this Hamiltonian and our our baryon we found our baryon state expand to the QQQ and the QQG. We can generate the light form wave function with dynamic gluon. And after we include the dynamic gluon, we can find that uh, we we can directly study the gluon distribution in pro, in proton or in neutron in nuclear. And this is the, our, the our gluon helicity distribution. We can find that at the small X region, and our error bar is quite small. And at a at a large region, is a more uh, is not uh, it's al almost the same with uh, uh, agree with the global phase data. And uh, this this talk, this part has been presented by Chandan, so I don't want to spend much more time over here. Okay, from now we can. Do uh, some like the extremely, uh, or how to say it, extremely good things that uh, we don't want to do the phenomenological model things, and we want to do a uh, interesting things that directly from the QCD to calculate the nu neutral nuclear and not not to use the some like the confined potential and not to use the some like effect interaction right now because we. Not like that. We don't like that things. And this is our, this is our original intention. And at the first attempt, we are trying to we are directly expand our fog sector from the two fog sector to uh, QQQGG fog sector. And at at the first at the first step, we can we are directly we we also we include the three uh, five quark component in our calculation and then. At this time, we try to remove the confined potential because in our study we find that the confined potential is uh, is some like is this, the effect is similar like a sim it's the confined potential is similar to the higher folk sector's contribution, and uh, it also has some give us some like, help us to control the end point behavior. So if we we think that if we continue to include the confined potential, but we and at the same time we expand the fog sector, it's hardly for it's harder to know the higher fog sector effect and the interaction effect. So at the first step, we rem, rem, we remove the confined potential and only use the interaction. Consider the five quark component. We include the G to QQ bar and the QG to QG instantaneous vortex in our calculation. We found that we got some result, and this is the first step. This result maybe not maybe not really good, but it's uh, it's as we think it's a clean, it's a very this uh, this calculation is very clean. So we can know a lot of things, and we can ex continue to expand, and we can study the next step, do the next step study, and so okay. And right now we can, and then we think that the, the interesting thing is that if we can include the high multi gluon fog sector that here is the QQQGG fog sector. And if we include the QQQGG fog sector, everything will be different because that's we, or here we include a three gluon vortex and the, the 
and the relevant uh, 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 instantaneous interaction. This is a this is the three interaction is not a, can it cannot be included in the QED system. That's the reason. That's from from this step, and we think we can we are truly step to the QCD system. Okay, and then and then as and then we know that the QCD must be considered the color, and the color as we include the higher fog sector, the complexity is much. So, uh, the complexity is become uh, larger and larger. So when we consider the QQQGG, we have a six color singular state. The six color singular state, we must consider the decuplate state, octet state combination. And after we deal with those color singular state and calculate the color factor, we can, we can implement the, um, to, we can implement those color factor to our interaction and then we can, Generate the last form wave function. Or here we want to try to make the clean in our calculation. So we only input the five parameter in our calculation. The five parameter uh, includes that of the three barrier mass and the coupling constant and, and the basis scale. Use this, use this file use a file parameter and at the fixed truncation parameter, we can directly calculate the okay. We can directly calculate the general. Uh, we can generate the wave function, and those wave function for the leading fog sector, we can say that its contribution is quite larger, is ninety percent almost. And the other part, the next leading fog sector, and the next next leading fog sector contribution around the ten percent. And after we use, we get this light from wave function. We can directly calculate the PDF and the PDF part on the function. The, the part of the function, we can include the, we can calculate the C quark and the UD and the valence quark. And this valence also includes the CDCU. And this is, and here is a gluon, gluon interaction. Due to that, uh, uh, our second fox sector and the third fox sector contribution is quite small. So we find that the gluon contribution is a little bit small. Okay. And okay, this is uh, we after we we get the PDF, we can we can calculate some like the PDF ratio and those things. To the PDF ratio is at the initial scale. This trend is almost okay. The, but the most important thing is or here is the PDF ratio at the x ten to one point. This this point is not a dig lab de dependent, and so we can. Only this point can be at the initial scale can be compared with the expanded data. Is we 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 say that Amarian data if we track extract from the uh, PDF ratio of the uh, of the D and the U, D quark and the U quark, we can get the result on around the point two seven, and that means our result more or less uh, almost agree with Amarian data and uh, our. Uh, uh, symmetry C almost uh, qualitative. We can see the qualitative agree with the expanded data, and we can get the CD is larger than CU. That's all. And this is as uh, and and then we can we wanted to know that the effect of the QQGG for example, if we include the three. Uh, three QCD special vertex uh, in our calculation. What what happened? And over here, this is our this is a different. We show the difference of gluon distribution. This this one is uh, without QQQG fog sector, and this the dashed line is uh, QQ, with include the QQQG and include the QCD three QCD vertex in our calculation result. We find that the after we include the the higher fog sector. And our gluon distribution has been surprised. Okay, and uh, except these things, we also can we also can call, use the light form wave function to calculate the helicity part on the function. Uh, this is our helicity function. We can get some like the the qualitative. Uh, we can get the uh, u the helicity of u bar larger than helicity of d bar, and we can get the c, sigma u and the sigma d. And uh, sigma u is a little bit larger than sigma d is a smaller uh, absolute value of sigma d is smaller than the kind of result. But we, if we look, at, if, I'm not, I'm not sure here. But if we compare with this, this data 
result, uh, we can compare with the, the QQQ, QQQ plus QQQG data. We find that uh, our this our result is more or less agree, same with the, our previous uh, phenomenological calculation results. Then this is our gluon contribution. Our gluon contribution is uh, quite uh, it's, uh, must be small. It's almost uh, uh, how's that uh, sixteen percent contribution. Okay. And another is a really important thing is the transversity part of the new function. This is directly related to the uh, directly related to the uh, speed uh, speed symmetry. And we use a, directly calculate the transversity part of the new function, and we can get the d quark is d quark is a negative contribution, and u quark is a positive contribution. This contribution directly come from the spin structure. We think we get the correct spin structure. And on the other hand, we calculate the tensor charge. Tensor charge is the d quark is minus 0.1 and the u quark is 0.91. As it's as is this is result at the initial scale. After we involve these things, we think our calculation result is still in the global fitting error bar. And consider the global error bar, our result almost agree with the x one data. Okay, just. That's a almost a finish. Okay. The gen, uh, that's, and uh, except that since we calculate the generalized pattern diffusion function, this only like show that we can calculate that since and our result, uh, our result all sign is okay, and we and uh, the distribution has almost has a good agreement with that since. This is uh, we also have gluon and the uh, string quark and the D D bar and the U bar. Sorry, I missing some bar and okay d bar and the u bar contribution okay uh, i almost finished that thing the the basis letter form quantization is a good approach and right now we don't want we don't satisfy that only do the new phenomenological things we wanted to do the first principle calculation so so we wanted to include the more higher and the higher fork sector right now we include the qqg gg fork sector and we can remove the, all the effect interaction and include the three gluon vortex and the relevant instantaneous QCD interaction. Our results has a qualitative agree with the global fitting data. And we want to establish a platform for to study the QCD as from the first principle way. So if we, if we, some scientists and have interest on these things, you can, we can collaborate, collaboration and we are welcome collaboration. And this is uh, we can uh, this is our next plan. And uh, for the first time, we can we will continue to expand the fork sector to QQQ, QQ bar G, and the QQ G G three gluon vortex and uh, three gluon fork sector. At this time, we can we find we uh, we think that we can include all QCD interaction. And uh, at that time, our physics is uh, we have a lot of physics and a lot we can get a lot of interesting things. But we think maybe we still need the because the fork sector limitation and the, so and the n max and the k max truncation we still need to consider some renormalization scheme. After that, we can actually we can study the intrinsic charm and the c quark uh, uh, symmetry and uh, because uh, the five quark component have a significant contribution. Is this all those things are good? Uh, can be studied good in our calculation. And the, 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 study, the, the spin and the mass decomposition is also a good idea, good, uh, can be, can be uh, partially studied, I think. Finally, we wanted to, we wanted to uh, one thing as we fork sector expansion, we can study the, the deuteron directly used because here we only need to consider the three, six quark components, five particle. Uh, seven particle component and eight particle component. It's uh, also can it also can be uh, expected. I think that's all. Well, thanks for the high aspirations. So there is a question. Like so, yeah. <laughs> just one second. Sorry, I didn't mean to. <laughs> so, 
with the in, in this approach and the several talks, uh, you, the fits that you show, how sensitive are they to the uh, values you choose for your quark masses? I mean, if I take those numbers seriously, your proton is one and a half GeV. Right. Right. And are you sensitive to those values? Can you modify them? We try our best to fix the uh, proton mass. And if the proton mass uh, uh, is uh, a little bit sensitive to the, uh, the u quark mass and the d quark mass. And, and use this way, we can almost uh, fix our quark mass and the proton constant. Uh, what? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I, I'm sorry, your question? I, I think the hope is to really relate this constituent quark mass to the real QCD quark mass. Yeah, yeah, we are, right. yeah, but this is the first time. Yeah. Okay. Work on it. Okay, all right. Uh, Siki, I am just wondering that your last calculation, you have the continuum. You have, you can break the proton above 1.5 GeV because you do not have explicit uh, confinement. How do you think uh, to to have the, I mean, the spectrum of the proton within this approach? You can. Well, no, we can also get the spectrum of the proton. We are trying to do that thing, but we think at least we need to do the thing to do that thing to do that thing to And then our, uh, just, uh, our five part component has a significant contribution. At that time, we may can study a part of study the low light uh, uh, study of nuclear uh, spectrum of the low light spectrum. And uh, up to now, we still. Uh, I think uh, always this uh, spectroscopy and the hadron st structure go together. So I think a lot of work to do. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other burning questions? Or... Okay. We have a uh, copy break soon, so we can talk more. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. The... Uh, the last talk of uh, this session is uh, uh, Bim Zehan Burja. So, uh, <laughs> okay. Oh, here it is. Okay. Okay, so good morning to all of you. Uh, so first of all, I will I, I would like to thank the uh, organizers and the International uh, Litecoin Advisory Com Committee uh, to uh, give this uh, uh, MECART award to me. So I will discuss about the drill and process with pions and polarized protons. And this work has been done uh, with uh, in collaboration uh, with uh, with my supervisor, Dr. Chandra Mandal. So these are the outcomes of my talk. First of all, I will uh, introduce the learn process uh, and I will uh, describe the dis dis disturbances, the difference between this uh, series DLN and uh, this uh, diadron product. And then uh, since uh, uh, to calculate those asymmetries, we need to address those uh, uh, transverse momentum dependent pattern distribution functions. Uh, from the uh, head on. So we, uh, I will uh, describe first uh, this uh, pion TMDs using this light front holographic uh, QCD. And uh, uh, the, uh, another, another thing is from uh, the, those uh, proton TMDs, which, which can be in this light front quark-di-quark -quark model. And then uh, to uh, calculate those 
TOTMDs, we need to uh, 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 address those initial, uh, initial, uh, initial uh, final state interactions. And then after that, uh, since uh, to uh, compare compare with the uh, experimental data, those asymmetries, we need to evolve those transverse momentum dependent distributions. And then uh, uh, finally, I will uh, show the, uh, the asymmetry re results and then I will conclude my talk. So, uh, so the transverse uh, momentum dependent pattern distribution functions uh, can be calculated by using this CDS process. And this process, uh, which we uh, uh, have to be uh, calculated in this uh, TMD factorization theorem, and this factorization factorization theorem is applicable for this uh, this Q path uh, much much smaller than this uh, hard scale. So, in the simplest DS process, uh, this uh, electron proton scattering and this uh, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, the uh, produced hadron, hadron uh, is in the uh, final state. And in the Delian process, uh, this is the uh, process where the, th those two hadrons are colliding uh, in the initial scale. And, and this uh, dielectron production is uh, going uh, in the final, final state. And in the uh, dihadron uh, production in E plus E minus. Uh, Annihilation. Uh, so there is a back-to-back -back scattering for back-to-back uh, -back production of the the diodes. And this process uh, provides the important information about the uh, TMDs. And uh, due to the slow counting rates, this Delian process is uh, is experimentally in less uh, favor. And uh, since it is a dihadron dihadron uh, collision uh, uh, pr process. We can address those uh, uh, TMDs from this uh, initial, initial state uh, of the hadrons, and uh, the uh, and this is uh, this process is also important because uh, uh, important and easiest because uh, out state no hadrons. So the factorization theorem. So in the factorization theorem, we can factor uh, uh, out by uh, uh, by using uh, these approximations and using those word identities, we can separate this hard part and the short part uh, uh, from this process. And uh, the total cross section in this uh, Delian process can be written uh, uh, by using this uh, convolution of uh, the uh, convolution of the uh, uh, part on uh, TMDs from the incoming hadrons, both of the in incoming hadrons and this uh, hard scattering part. And whereas the uh, total cross section in the uh, semi inclusive DS process can be written in terms of the convolution of this uh, incoming, uh, the TMDs of the incoming hadron and the, uh, 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 the fragmentation function functions of the uh, outgoing hadrons, uh, followed by this uh, hard scattering part. So, uh, since those TMDs are um, important for the, to study the transverse, uh, uh, transverse structure of the hadrons. So, and those TMDs are much more informative than, the, than this collinear pattern distribution functions. So, one can uh, address those transverse momentum dependent distributions uh, by using this, uh, 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 by Im imposing those transverse momenta. Uh, and at leading peak, there are two pi on TMD, TMDs. So, out of eight, there are six time reversally even, and two, out of uh, two, are uh, the time reversally odd. And by, uh, by uh, including the quark and uh, spin and uh, polarization, uh, transverse momentum polarization, we can uh, divide those TMDs uh, in uh, uh, in eight, eight uh, I mean, eight components. So this, the first one is the unpolarized PDF, uh, sorry, TMD, which is coming from the unpolarized quark inside this, the unpolarized hadron or proton. And uh, this one is the Sievers TMD, which is which can be calculated by, which uh, describes the distribution of uh, the uh, uh, unpolarized quark inside the transversely polarized nucleon. And uh, the another is the Bohr modulus TMD, uh, which can be uh, which describes the distribution of the transversely polarized uh, uh, parton inside the unpolarized. And uh, the transverse CT distribution. Just, uh, describes the distribution of the transversely polarized quarks or uh, partons inside the trans, uh, transversely polarized uh, uh, nucleon. And this worm gear and this helicity are they also have uh, the distributions of this uh, long terminally polarized uh, uh, 
part one inside the uh, uh, local nucleon nucleon and so on so uh, so in the tmd factorization this uh, total cross section uh, can be written in terms of six independent structure functions and uh, those uh, four uh, the green uh, structure functions can be calculated by uh, can be measured from this uh, compass data uh, uh, but this f uh, ful and fuu those uh, cannot be measured in the compass because uh, in case of this FUL, the targets will be long longitudinally polarized. And in case of uh, this FUU, uh, this, uh, this is also uh, a uh, chiral, chiral order function. So it, it is not, uh, I mean, easy to uh, measure in the compass experiments. So by, uh, so, and those, those are the weight factors which can be described by this, uh, uh, hadronic plane, uh, hadronic and lepton, uh, hadron, had, hadronic, hadronic plane and leptonic plane. So those structure, func structure functions uh, can be written uh, in terms of the convolution of the, the this uh, transverse momentum dependent part on distribution functions, and uh, these asymmetries can be uh, uh, written the ratio of these uh, uh, structure functions. So uh, yeah. So uh, to calculate those asymmetries, we need to uh, include these uh, transverse TMDs from both the uh, uh, incoming uh, 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 pion beam and the target uh, uh, proton. So uh, in case of the proton, uh, sorry, pion, there are two TMDs, F1. This is the uh, qua-qua correlation function for this uh, two pion. And this F1 is the unpolarized uh, uh, quark inside the pion. And this H1 pop gives the Bohr modulus, which describes the uh, distribution of the uh, transversely polarized uh, uh, parton inside the pion, and this H1 pop is time reversally uh, odd, which gives this, uh, which is the uh, time reversally uh, gives the in, uh, invariance of the QCD. So, so uh, to calculate those uh, TMDs, we have to uh, calculate this light front wave functions. So, by using this light, light front uh, holographic QCD, one can calculate this. Uh, mass uh, light front wave function for this uh, pion. So this is the uh, semi-classical approximation, uh, approximation uh, wave equation for these uh, transverse uh, uh, components. Uh, and uh, this is the longitudinal, uh, this contains the longitudinal uh, modes. And uh, uh, this this zeta here is the transverse separation between the quark, active quark and the uh, anti-quark. And uh, this total mass of the system should be the uh, transverse part plus this long, longitudinal part. So uh, to uh, calculate uh, the light front wave functions, uh, Dorothy and uh, so initially uh, there was uh, in in case of the chiral limit, this uh, uh, this term was not there. This mass of the uh, light quark masses were not there. So Dorothy and his collaborators uh, uh, imposed this invariant mass as such, and they uh, uh, transform this k k pop to uh, k pop plus those mass uh, light light quark mass dependent terms. And the total wave functions can be written uh, in the factor can be factorized in terms of this transverse components and the longitudinal components. So uh, after imposing the spin improved holographic wave uh, spin improved uh, of the quarks, uh, this total holographic wave, wave functions can be written uh, by this one. And this here, this B is the uh, this spin improved holographic variable. And those are the results for the pion unpolarized. Uh, PDF uh, after so after including this uh, spin improve uh, part, these results are much agreement with the experimental data, and uh, here uh, we calculate this uh, pion uh, Bohr-Muller functions to uh, address those asymmetries at uh, uh, this uh, initial uh, sorry after the evolution of uh, this uh, pion Bohr-Muller function. Now, uh, the another thing is uh, we need to uh, uh, calculate those uh, TMDs from this uh, target side. So uh, since in, in, in our case, the target is proton. So we uh, build a model. I mean, this model has been built uh, in, in our group. And in, in this model, this is a simple model where this uh, incoming uh, uh, virtual uh, photon interacts with the active parton and the rest of the things known as the spectator system, which is the diquark system. And this diquark can have either spin zero, known as the scalar diquark, or spin one, known as the XL vector diquark. 
So depending on the uh, spin structure, this total uh, by using this SU4 spin, uh, spin flavor structure, uh, this total proton state can be written in terms of this uh, isoscalar scalar part, isoscalar axial vector part, and the is iso vector axial vector parts. And uh, the two particle Fock state expansion for this proton can be written uh, by uh, this expression. And here, this uh, psi uh, lambda is the uh, uh, quark helicity, and this plus minus are the nucleon helicities can be written alongside with this two particle bonds system. And those are the electron wave functions. So, uh, and uh, the for the vector diquark, this is, uh, two particle bond states can be written uh, by this. Okay, and the those electron wave functions can are given by this one. So here, this n nu is the normalization constant, which can be fixed by using the uh, uh, quark counting some rules. And this f f is the function of x and uh, I mean this is the function of spin and momentum distributions uh, uh, momentum. And this phi is the um, uh, important thing which is coming from this ADSQCD side. So this in the soft wall, soft soft wall uh, ADSQCD wave functions, the two particle bond state system can be written by this. So uh, here this uh, A and B are the uh, model parameters which can be fixed from this using uh, the electromagnetic form factors. And uh, uh, this kappa is the ADS scale parameter which uh, which is adopted from this uh, this Brodsky environment paper. Yeah. So now to uh, calculate those uh, asymmetries, we have to address those TMDs. So first of all, this uh, this unpolarized proton TMDs, uh, which calculated by using this light front quark dichroic model, and uh, uh, it compared with the uh, it compared with the available extractions from this MSTW and this NNPDF data at uh, uh, this evolved scales. And the another TMD we need to uh, calculate this uh, transversity distributions, which are also uh, 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 for the aqua case, the distribution is uh, coming with uh, in agreement with this this BR 2018 uh, uh, analysis, but uh, the rest of them are um, they have some higher higher values. But for this down quark uh, transversity distribution, uh, our model results are I mean consistent with the, all of them uh, which uh, which are given here. So another TMD to address those uh, asymmetries is the prejolicity TMD, and uh, this contributes to this sine two phi plus phi s asymmetry. So these are the uh, results from this uh, light and quark dichroic model for this uh, prejolicity TMD, and uh, the another TMD which is uh, which will be convolute, convolute in the sine two phi asymmetry is given this cotian uh, modulus TMD. Which is calculated from uh, this uh, light and dichroic model, and there are no extraction. These. So now to uh, calculate those TO TMDs, we have to use this finally finally state interactions or in, in, initial state interactions. So a one a gluon exchange between the actin part on and the spectral system known as the. Uh, uh, so if if we consider in the final final state case. Then it, it is known as the FSI. And if we, uh, this gluon exchange between the active part on and this uh, and this uh, spectral system in the initial scale known as the initial state interactions. And this 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 part is uh, uh, contributing to, to study the seven glycid DS process, whereas uh, this uh, this initial state interactions are important to uh, include incorporate in uh, this data process. And uh, in the uh, this TMD correlator, there are this uh, gluon uh, lensing uh, gluon uh, gas link which connects those two quark field operators. So from this G1 to G2, one can go from this side. Um, this is known as the final state interactions, uh, which uh, gives this uh, future pointing lines, and uh, which, which has been used in the semi implicit DIS process. And this. In case of the Dalian process, uh, this is the uh, pass, pass pointing uh, Wilson line. And in case of uh, to calculate those T1 TMDs, we denote uh, we can use this uh, Wilson line in the unity. And but in case of to cal uh, calculate those T TO distributions, we uh, this Wilson uh, Wilson line is some more complicated function, which can be given by uh, the expansion of this uh, W G1 G2. 
so this severs and bromine uh, tmds uh, uh, are uh, they have opposite signs in semen inclusive dis and relay and processes this has been confirmed from this hab compass data so uh, the, uh, okay so to consider those fsi we we, we can uh, 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 use this uh, uh, risk adding kernel uh, they are uh, which are the propagators uh, uh, going from uh, active part onto spectrum spectator system and uh, we uh, use this uh, we go beyond this even uh, abelian uh, uh, picture we use this as you three non non abelian non perturbative uh, risk adding kernel we can uh, see those difference from this figure so once we uh, include uh, only this u1 gluon then it will be diverged at uh, q tends to zero but if we uh, if we consider this as you three perturbative risk adding Uh, it, it, since it depends on uh, one uh, x bar which is 1 minus x uh, it will not be diverged at q tends to in the low low, low energy so we can include uh, those uh, uh, risk adding kernels to calculate those uh, t or tmds and this uh, qcd lensing okay so this risk adding kernels uh, are uh, ca uh, can be uh, calculated by using this lensing function and those qcd lensing functions are obtained from this iconic uh, iconal uh, amplitudes of the quark anti quark scattering by exchanging the one gluon exchange one gluon non abelian soft gluon exchange <coughs> and this lensing function <coughs> which connects the uh, uh, first moment of this pine uh, bohr muller functions with this uh, chiral od gpd h so those are uh, the for uh, this perturbative by using the tmds for the sievers uh, by using this perturbative and non perturbative uh, uh, risk scattering kernels and we notice uh, in our model that in case of this uh, scalar dicoc model those sievers and bohr muller are exactly same this is also uh, <coughs> uh, um, i mean calculated by using uh, this group and they also they also get the same results for this as uh, sievers and bohr muller tmds for the scalar dicoc cases so here we calculate the first moment for this uh, sievers tmd and we compare with this uh, available phenomenological extractions uh, uh, from this uh, collins and uh, this anchel you know, uh, group yeah and those are the uh, half moments of this sievers uh, tmds but in case of this axial vector dicoc model this uh, they are not exactly uh, same i mean uh, in 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 magnitude they are different so uh, this uh, this sievers tmd for the uh, up quark and this bohr muller tmd for the up quark are i mean they have similar sign but uh, magnitude wise they are different for in case of the scalar and axial vector di quark models but this down quark tmds are different uh, to each other so uh, for the down down quark sievers uh, tmd which positive and this uh, down quark uh, 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 bohr muller tmd is ne negative but here we can see that that uh, those uh, yeah so this this uh, i mean this is a different for this model so uh, to uh, compare compare uh, uh, our tmds uh, or asymmetries with the experimental data we evolved our tmd distributions so those tmd distributions ca can be uh, this evolution equation uh, in uv pretty tells this collins of collins super evolution equations to evolve those tmd distributions so those evolution equations can be written by this one so here left hand side part is the uh, evolved this uh, tmd distribution and uh, this uh, right hand side part is uh, um, uh, the tmd at initial scale in the uh, impact parameter space and the rest thing is the evolution kernels known as the perturbative pseudo co form factor and the non perturbative pseudo co form factor perturbative pseudo co form factor calculated by using this perturbative uh, uh, qcd and uh, okay uh, yeah and this uh, the mu b is the uh, initial tmd scale and this b star is the uh, uh, i mean adopted prescri prescription uh, to avoid uh, this land of hole or land of gaze uh, things and uh, this b max can be fixed from this uh, uh, this condition that b max cannot be greater than this this uh, cutoff scale so 
this b max uh, always remains in the perturbative region so we can uh, see from here if we go uh, in the higher bt region then this thing will be uh, uh, exactly b max and if we go in this lower bt region then this uh, bt could be zero so this uh, b star is the reason to introduce the, those non non perturbative pseudo coform factors so those non perturbative pseudo coform factors can be cal calculated uh, I mean, it can be calculated by using some uh, uh, global analysis or uh, can uh, calculated by ph phenomenologically. And here, uh, this non perturbative pseudo form factor can be by uh, this expression. I mean, model. Uh, uh, phenomenology side okay and uh, in the, uh, this part, part uh, sort of two, uh, in our calculation two and b and uh, next to leading logarithmic uh, uh, those in case of the uh, those structures be written in terms of the Fourier transform of those uh, uh, those uh, TMD from TMDs, uh, and this uh, evolution can be done by using this uh, this equation. And this BN can be uh, related with the uh, uh, twist to TMD distribution uh, and those structure functions uh, also. So uh, this FUU is the unpolarized functions which can be calculated by the evol uh, convolution of, of the unpolarized TMD from uh, both the Incoming laptop, uh, in, incoming pion beam, and this uh, target hadron, target proton. And this FUU cos two phi is the uh, convolution from this pion bormuller TMD as well as this proton bormuller TMD. But, uh, this asymmetry, uh, I mean, this structure functions is convolution of this uh, bormuller uh, uh, TMD from the pion and the, this uh, from this proton. And similarly, this sine sin phi as asymmetry can be calculated by uh, using this uh, unpolarized uh, pion TMD and the CVS TMD. And uh, the, uh, this sine 2 phi pion minus phi S can be calculated by using this uh, pion uh, bormuller and this uh, transversity from this proton. And the last, uh, this sine 2 phi plus phi S can be calculated by using this uh, uh, pion bormuller and this uh, uh, prezilocity TMD of this uh, proton. So now, and those asymmetrical can be uh, and those structure functions are the convolutions of those uh, pion and proton tmds Convolutions can be written by this These are the re results uh, for this uh, uh, sine 2 phi minus phi, uh, phi s asymmetry and uh, since uh, uh, this uh, Asymmetry is negative. The total asymmetry is negative. Means this, uh, this pion, uh, this uh, since this, uh, uh, sorry, this proton transversity for up quark is positive, and we can uh, say that this uh, uh, pion bormuller only the in that case this, this asymmetry can and uh, compass uh, data. I use this convolution of those for this CVS asymmetry. And uh, it, it results shows that uh, the change, sign change of from this series to drill and process is also uh, achieved in, in our calculations as well. And the third is the this sign 2 5, minus, uh, 2 5 plus 5 asymmetry. And this is uh, much, much uh, smaller than compared to the others one. And because in the convolution, we are getting the yeah, we are getting this q power three, which is uh, and our uh, due to uh, can be can be be very small. And uh, this is the two sine two phi symmetry can be calculated from this uh, uh, the convolution of those uh, two TMDs and compare uh, our results with available phenomena because no experimental data for for this asymmetry. 
the, the last one is the post to asymmetry. So in our case, uh, this asymmetry is coming uh, slightly uh, small as compared to other uh, available extraction. And uh, this asymmetry uh, is proportional to the uh, uh, pion bormulas as well as the proton bormulas. Since the pion bormulas is uh, uh, the sign of the pion, bor pion bormula TMD is positive. And from here, we can see that this total asymmetry should be positive means this proton uh, bo proton bormula function also should be positive. And uh, these are the conclusion of my talk. So we uh, present a complete description uh, of uh, this polarized delay at leading twist TMDs by using this NLL, NN, NLL accuracy. And the required TMDs uh, includes uh, from the nucleon side are both and from the pion side are these unpolarized uh, bormulas. And uh, this TO TMD distribution uh, requires this rescattering kernel. So we uh, use this U1 uh, abelian as well as SU3 non perturbative non abelian kernels. And uh, in our analysis, we show that uh, those asymmetries can be com uh, compared as the com quality description described from the sign and magnitude. They are, uh, I mean, in agreement with our calculations or our results as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for all the, those calculations and so on. Uh, we have uh, just a couple of uh, minutes uh, for any uh, comment questions. Oh, very nice talk. I have a naive question. So in this, in your uh, quark, quark, uh, model we function, um, why there is no isovector scalar? You have three terms, right? Um, you have both, I say, isoscalar, scalar, isoscalar vector, and isovector vector, I think. Isovector, axial vector, I think. Right, right, right. So why, why, why there is no isovector scalar piece term? Like a CVS, you have CS, CV, CVV, but why there is no CVS? So yeah, you, the isoscalar part you have both a scalar and a vector. Uh, yeah, but why the isovector part only has a uh, iso, uh, axial vector? No, 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 the corresponding scalar part. Uh, yeah, I guess more calculations need to be done. But anyway, uh, is there a, any other comment, questions? Okay, so uh, let's thank the speaker again. And uh, just uh, uh, there is a, some <clears throat> little change in the uh, ceremony program. We just heard that <laughs> organizers checking the uh, the banky place tomorrow, and turns out that, that that place is not so good for the ceremony and so on. So they recommend that it's better just to eat here. So we are going to do just a few minutes of this little ceremony and giving out the uh, certificate and so on. So I'd like to have uh, James to come up and then talk about, you know, he knows uh, all the, uh, you know, experiences he had with Gary McArthur uh, when he arrived and so on. So he will talk a little bit of history and then I think he will present this certificate. So okay. please come up here. Okay. So if some of you uh, know, uh, but most people probably did not have the opportunity to uh, meet uh, Gary McArthur. Uh, Gary uh, was a Long, long term member of this community, uh, one of the founders of this, uh, this uh, series of uh, uh, conferences that's been running, as was mentioned, since 1991, and a uh, regular participant and a very uh, strong supporter of uh, younger people entering uh, the field. And at one of our Lycone meetings, actually the one in Minneapolis um, back in the early 2000 era, uh, we uh, conceived the idea of a fund 
not not necessarily not named after him, but a fund uh, to raise money for supporting young people uh, in their early careers to come and attend these meetings, to develop their networks, and uh, help get their uh, career careers further established. So, uh, together with Gary and others, we approached the uh, uh, Sura, which is the Southeastern University's Research Association, which is the ma major uh, organization that runs JLab uh, to see if they would be willing to host a nonprofit uh, fund uh, to do this uh, kind of activity, raise money and support uh, younger people in the field. And it was enthusiastically accepted. So ever since then, there, there's been a nonprofit organization called ILCAC, now called ILCAC Inc., which is a uh, national Cone advisory committee, runs here. Well, subsequent to the founding of this fund, uh, with a year, unfortunately, Gary passed away um, because of a, a, a DC that uh, was very fast and progressive. And so for, for various reasons, we uh, decided to name the fund after, in honor of him, because he was such a pioneer pushing this, uh, this cause. Together with his, uh, his wife and others, uh, the fund was established uh, with donations from family and friends of Gary McCarter and then has continued with other generous donations uh, up to the present time, both with the generous donations and the in-kind contributions from organi organizers of these meetings, about 20 donors in total, about $100,000 or more has been raised. And we're delighted uh, that uh, the current three recipients are here uh, to receive this uh, Gary McCarter Award. And we look forward to uh, continuing this fund in honor of, of uh, Gary's promotion of the careers of young people. So thank you. And I'll turn it back over. To you. Yeah, young thanks. Person. Thanks very much, James. Uh, so I guess uh, th this certificate uh, is given uh, on behalf of uh, this IRCAC uh, committee. Uh, and then also uh, this LightCon uh, conference. Uh, Chair. So uh, uh, first, let me just call each one. <laughs> so uh, first, uh, Herb, uh, Herb, you can yeah, come. Maybe you to be a And in the end, good job. So I think we just all three. Yeah, yeah. 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 
Thank you very much. And uh, I, I heard that uh, there, uh, there will be a whole guru photo just outside, you know, in the coffee break. Don't forget, right? Was it, was it coffee break? Yeah, yeah. Just, just before the coffee break. Yeah, we can just come over there.
positronium structure from PLFQ. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, 30 minutes. Okay. Um, so, um, so first of all, I would like to um, thank the organizers for uh, speaking here in a such a beautiful city. Um, uh, today, I'm uh, going to talk about uh, positronium structure from basis light from quantization. So most of the numerical results um, I'm talking uh, today are generated by our graduate students, um, Mr. Um, Kai Yu Fu. So um, this is the outline of my talk. So it has um, four parts. First of all, I would like to introduce um, the motivation and background for this project. And then I will introduce uh, the technical detail, how we solve positronium in basis light from quantization. Then uh, I will introduce our uh, numerical results. So um, the, the background, um, the motivation of the, um, this project is um, actually the history of this project actually first is uh, very, uh, very long. So basically the, the main motivation is like uh, we want to use positronium um, as a testing ground uh, for our uh, non-perturbative approach um, because this is the simplest bound state in QED because we know uh, our, although our ultimate goal is to solve QCD, but um, I mean, Intuitively, we think QED is simpler because it, the, the interaction part at least is simpler. And it's also a gauge theory. So it uh, would be uh, good if we use the um, uh, simplest bound state in QED to uh, check, uh, to, to, to make a sanity check of this, our non perturbative approach, for example, basis light from quantization. Um, this is um, uh, motivation. And then um, another, let's say, layer is like this if, if uh, we get uh, succeeded. Um, this is um, this positronium has a uh, bears a lot of similarity in terms of structure uh, with the uh, meson in QCD. So basically, we can gain a lot of experience from studying um, positronium. We can basically compare the structure between positronium and the mesons in QCD. So the 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 um, uh, of course in QED, the positronium itself is an interesting object to study. It has its own um, very interesting history. It was basically first suggested by Mahorovich in uh, 1934. And then it, later it was discovered by Deutsch from um, um, the actually uh, from observing this uh, beta plus decay of uh, sodium 22 uh, in, a, um, in, a, in a gas chamber. So, um, so, so far up to now, the um, theoretical study of positronium um, are uh, mainly from uh, using the approach of non relativistic uh, quantum mechanics uh, and then with some relativistic, uh, let's say, perturbative corrections. So this is so far the main um, um, method to study the uh, structure of positronium. And uh, the, the, let's say the, 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 the structure, the force structure in terms of uh, quantum field theory is still not so clear so far. So, big, so, so in this sense, this um, study is also interesting in the sense that it's uh, also related to, to the uh, long-term, let's say, long-standing question like uh, whether or how uh, non-perturbative quantum field theory makes sense. So, so this is also we want to, let's say, um, address um, in um, in this project. Um, so yeah, this project has basically, um, as I said, some, let's say, uh, actually history. Actually, we started this because when I was a postdoc in James Place, um, this was so first suggested by Stan Broski as a, a, let's say, sanity check of basis light from quantization. So uh, and actually, it has been uh, studied um, a long time ago by uh, people uh, for example, in the in the Hans Christian Dr. Hans Christian Pauli group, and uh, about ten years ago, it was also revisited by uh, Harry Lam and uh, let's say by actually by us in basis like from quantization. So, um, uh, I, before I talk, uh, let's say our current calculation, I want to introduce uh, some let's say uh, limitations in previous uh, calculations. So, in the previous calculation, they are mostly um, uh, they are also done in um, let's say uh, DLCQ or similar let's say. Um, Approaches. So, so there the limitations. One, uh, so it's like uh, because of the previous um, computational, let's say, a limitation on computational resources. So previously it was uh, done mostly at uh, enlarged, artificially enlarged alpha around 0.3, because it's less uh, challenging numerically. Um, and also uh, for a lot of those, uh, most of the previous approaches they are done in a uh, effective one photon exchange interaction with only leading fog sector. And the, the, the basically the, the, the results are basically for this calculation are mostly um, the results are mostly stable with respect to a uh, basis truncation with one additional, let's say, um, uh, procedure, which is um, 
we have to basically um, um, introduce additional counter term in this effective one photon exchange interaction to remove a data function like interaction, which uh, this uh, without removing this part, uh, the, it will basically lead to divergence. So with, with this additional procedure, uh, most of the calculation, basically the conclusion is that the convergence, okay, I think Professor Avery also uh, talked about this um, results briefly um, uh, on Monday. And there, the previous, there are some attempts to uh, try to um, go beyond the one photon exchange uh, effects interaction. Uh, however, um, uh, previous, like the the, uh, the, uh, the study was performed in a DLCQ. Um, the, uh, it was found that the convergence is poor and there is no reliable way to extract, uh, like, uh, uh, for example, ground state binding energy. And also because of the SQ basis, the rotational symmetry um, in this box sector, it's um, highly down trivial to be checked. Um, so I think in this uh, talk, uh, we will proceed in a uh, basis slide from quantization. Um, so I think there are many talks already introducing the basic ideas of basis slide from quantization. Uh, so basically I will not, uh, let's say, uh, let's say, uh, see the gain for every details, but I will just let's say uh, pick up, uh, uh, let's say mention some uh, crucial ones which are relevant for this study. So the the main idea is to solve the uh, non perturbative solve this eigenvalue problem of uh, light front Hamiltonian, uh, and then we uh, the, the resulting light front uh, resulting eigenvector will be identified as the um, uh, front, light front wave function, and the remaining uh, study uh, resembles um, the procedure we did usually in the uh, quantum mechanics by sandwiching pertinent operators. Um, so basically, um, in this, um, um, in this, basically, the idea of this study is we want to go, um, uh, let's say, uh, with uh, first principle calculation. We want to uh, directly um, with, uh, uh, let's say, solve it with the QCD, um, sorry, QED, um, let's from Hamiltonian. And the next talk by Kemia will uh, adopt a completely different, let's say, uh, approach, uh, let's say approach in, in terms of the inter input interaction, input Hamiltonian. But, uh, but for, 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 for the current project, basically um, the things that we are using uh, light, uh, basis light from quantization and uh, it's, uh, we are solving in a sort of not so efficient basis, like um, um, in this, um, the, in the transverse uh, direction, we use a two dimensional harmonic oscillator basis. It has a, a built in scale parameter, uh, we call it B. And then um, in the longitudinal direction, we use plane wave uh, with the truncation parameter k, which is the uh, sum of all the longitudinal momentum carried by uh, all these uh, fog particles in each fog sector. Uh, in the transverse direction, we also have this max truncation. Um, basically, the larger max truncation means uh, 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 the um, quantum numbers of harmonic oscillator basis states are allowed to uh, have um, higher radial and angular and azimuthal excitations. So larger max means uh, simultaneously higher with, with fixed B, uh, simultaneously higher UV cutoff and the lower IR cutoff. Of course, the price we pay is the larger numerical metrics, not larger Hamiltonian metrics to diagonalize, uh, more expensive in terms of numerical um, resources. Um, so, um, so this is basically, um, uh, let's say, uh, our starting point. We want to start directly from um, QED Lagrangian. So, um, so yeah, then uh, we um, think it is Hamiltonian framework. So we make the Lagrange transform in the light cone gauge to get this light from the QED Hamiltonian. And it's, uh, it, ha it has um, only five terms. It's, uh, it's very simple in structure, in terms of structure. The first two terms are the kinetic energy terms of um, the, the, the fermion and the gauge boson, um, <coughs> respectively, the, 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 the electron and the positron and the, the photon. And um, if for, for the, let's say, truncation up to the leading uh, two fog sectors, we actually, we don't have this instantaneous um, fermion interaction because um, um, according to the so-called gauge principle, if we have the, 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 the instantaneous interaction, it should also, it should always be, uh, a, let's say, should always exist together with the non-instantaneous, non the, the dynamical, let's say, fermion. But uh, if we have a dynamic, dynamic fermion, this interaction would, uh, ex would be beyond our current box at the truncation. So since uh, we are only truncated to E plus E minus and E plus E minus gamma, so we also eliminate this interaction. So, so we end up with only solving the eigenvalue problem of these um, remaining four terms, which includes the vertex interaction as well as instantaneous uh, photon interaction. This is our starting point. So um, 
we uh, this is a let's say um, brief um, summarize of the structure of Hamiltonian matrix uh, we are working with. So basically, this is the only the interaction part of the Hamiltonian uh, matrix. So we can see that in the leading fog sector, we have an instantaneous photon. This is not good one, but photon interaction. And um, um, in the, let's say, um, off diagonal terms coupling the E plus, E minus, and E plus, E minus gamma sector, we have uh, the vertex interaction. And uh, again, due to this gauge principle, we om omit the instantaneous photon interaction in the E plus, E minus photon sector. Because um, uh, again, if we want to include it, we should also include the non-instantaneous uh, version, which would be um, beyond this, uh, um, uh, would be beyond this um, uh, E plus E minus gamma truncation. It would be uh, it would we would need E plus E minus gamma gamma two gammas because uh, one gamma is a spectator. Then the, the non instantaneous version will contain a dynamical photon. So so uh, since we truncated away E plus E minus gamma gamma fog sector, so we should also omit the instantaneous photon exchange interaction in the E plus E minus gamma fog sector to make it a sort of um, gauge invariant. Or trying uh, try to be gauge invariant. That was basically a study that in previous um, in the uh, I think this paper was basically done by a student of Stan Brosky. Um, so the the thing is um, um, since uh, we are working with uh, let's say um, uh, two fog sectors, so so we we will have let's say um, kind of loop diagram like this kind of self energy uh, loop diagram uh, dynamically generated. Uh, uh, during the process of uh, diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. So we, the, the mass of the fermion need to be renormalized. Or in, in, our, in, our, in other words, the mass we put in the light front Hamiltonian should be the bare mass. So um, yeah, we know that uh, one uh, of the very successful um, non perturbative renormalization scheme, at least in QED, it has been demonstrated uh, to be the sector-dependent de sector renormalization. So uh, we just adopt this uh, strategy. And uh, in order to uh, retain predictive power on the mass spectrum of positronium, so the uh, mass renormalization needs to be done, performed on a, each individual uh, electron or positron level, so that um, we don't use the ground state um, uh, positronium mass as the input. We use it as output to, to check, uh, the, let's say, the sanity of the non-perturbative non method. So um, here there's, uh, there, there, um, uh, one, let's say, complication additional because of the um, uh, finite truncation, ba finite basis truncation in basis light from quantization. So different basis states have different, let's say, room or available quanta to fluctuate, fluctuate into higher fog sectors. So, so in order to fully comply with the spirit of sector dependent renormalization, we actually we push it one step further. We implement the so-called basis state dependent um, uh, renormalization. So different basis state in the in the leading fog sector. Uh, in the E plus E minus sector, receive a different uh, mass counter term because this can be imagined because uh, for some basis this which uh, um, itself has very small longitudinal momentum, for example, it would have a very uh, little room or quanta, quanta available for this um, self energy correction. So the uh, mass uh, counter term received by that basis state should be understandably should be smaller compared to a basis state with a lot of available quantum number. Uh, uh, within the same, let's say, a max truncation, a max k truncation scheme. So uh, we end up actually um, generate an um, um, array of uh, um, mass counter terms for each, let's say, basis state in the leading fog sector. Yeah, the, 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 the basis state in the E plus E minus gamma sectors uh, does not need um, to be renormalized because according to the spirit of sector dependent renormalization, that's already, already the highest fog sector, no further higher fog sector. So um, so this is basically what we did. And uh, one thing we can notice that um, actually, um, the, so, so yeah, along the way, I will introduce actually what this uh, project is much more difficult or much more challenging than we initially thought. So um, one challenge we immediately see is that this, um, this, this is uh, numerically challenging because the mass counter term is on the order of, um, just from perturbation theory, the order of um, alpha, but the, the signal we want to seek is the binding energy is on the order of alpha squared. So we can imagine for the physical coupling we want to try, yeah, uh, in this uh, in this case because if we want to compare with experiments of uh, the only uh, in nature there only exists the polytronium um, of the physical coupling one over one hundred thirty seven, so so it's a very challenging numerical issue because the mass counter term has to be uh, performed the mass renormalization has to has to be performed very accurately to reveal the let's say 
the signal, the binding, the, 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 the binding, let's say, energy of the polytonium state. This is one of the challenges. So initially, when we implemented uh, all those sector dependent realization, we thought we should be able to get a convergent result for polytonium. But actually, the uh, uh, let's say the, 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 the situation is uh, tougher. So we still observe um, divergences, divergence persists. So, so this is, uh, so basically we can see that um, the, the yellow curve, uh, yellow dots are basically the naive diagnosis without factor dependent realization. So the, the, even the order of magnitude is completely wrong. Um, so when we um, implement the sector dependent realization, we found that the situation is much better. It, it goes to, from the, blue, uh, the yellow dots to the blue dots. However, uh, the, 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 let's say the downward trend is still there. So we, we increase um, uh, Mx uh, or K, for example, our truncation parameter. We, we all find that the, the, this um, 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 is still, let's say, um, unstable. So which uh, reminds us of this early finding from uh, uh, the students or the collaborators of Professor Hans Christian Pauli. So once we include, uh, uh, let's say, because in that work, there are also some, um, um, let's say, uh, mass quantum from perturbation theory was also uh, inputted. So they also did some sort of mass renormalization, but still they, they don't uh, observe stable results with respect to um, basis truncations. So basically it's the same thing. So um, so we uh, spend a lot of time um, uh, inspecting what is going on. So we found that um, as we basically, actually when uh, Mx is not too big, actually the, the binding energy is not also not very bad. No, 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 not, not bad, not too bad. But as a max or truncation parameter continues to increase, then it the the, the let's say this uh, binding energy of ground state we are um, slowly diverge diverge from the experimental value. So we um, we expect this um, actually one of the we we seek let's say the clue from rotational symmetry because we know that uh, the rotational symmetry is a uh, dynamic on light ground is highly non-trivial. We found that indeed as we expected at small max when the trunk the basis is not so big actually. Um, the, the the rotational symmetry, which we um, let's say test. I think in principle there are many ways, but we use a, let's say a simple and a quick way. We just um, uh, let's say find the first excited state, which would be a triplet state in the polytonium let's say, spectrum. So we uh, observe this. Uh, we compare the mass or binding energy between the mg zero substate and mg one substate. Um, we basically um, find that indeed, as we expected. If the truncation parameters are small or the basic size is small, the uh, rotational symmetry is okay, relatively okay. However, as we increase uh, basis truncation parameters, we will find in the in the same process as the uh, binding energy diverges, actually the rotational symmetry is getting worse and worse. So, so this is basically um, um, one um, let's say um, inf uh, information we got, like uh, like uh, when we increase from max eight and uh, to max twenty. The, the, the binding energy is, is going downward, but the rotational symmetry is also uh, becoming worse and worse. This is what we observed. Um, so basically then uh, we have a, a natural uh, thinking is like, uh, so this is basically the key of this talk. One of the keys of this talk is like, uh, we, th we have this conjecture is like, uh, um, maybe with fog sector truncation um, existing, then it is not okay to push the, Truncation parameter in momentum space, sort of in momentum space or harmonic oscillator space to infinity. So, in, in some sense, the truncation of uh, fog sector is uh, linked together with the truncation in momentum sp uh, space of each fog particle. So, this this linking, this connection is somehow dictated by rotational symmetry. So, we want to explore the idea like uh, we um, only initial uh, like the idea is we only let's say uh, look at or on, only consider those uh, bases. Um, size with um, a good rotational symmetry to be um, uh, to be accepted. So we only work in the basis size, which um, in which the rotational symmetry is okay. So then, um, so basically, um, uh, one thing uh, we can do uh, conven conveniently with harmonic oscillator basis is remember it has a basis scale parameter b. So basically, for given a max and k, we can basically tune the basis parameter b. So that um, it basically equivalently we are tuning the IR and the UB cutoff of our basis. So that indeed we, we found that the splitting between MG0 and MG1 substate of the lowest triplet state, this mass gap is a function of the basis B. So we can always tune the basis B such that these two uh, states are exactly the same with same, 
as a degeneracy with, with a degenerate, degenerate binding energy. So indeed, we found that um, well, with this um, um, with this tuning, basically we got have a less uh, much better convergence with respect to Mx, the transverse um, with uh, the transverse um, uh, cutoff parameter. So previously with a fixed B, uh, the, the, um, the divergence uh, you can see is, uh, is tuned by the yellow dots. It quickly diverges as a function of the max. But for if we increase the max, we always retune B so that at each max, the base, the, the rotational symmetry is kept, is um is sort of being kept. Um, with uh then then as a max increases, we have uh we uh, we observe a much better, much better let's say convergence uh, trend. Um. Right. This I think this um. Yeah, this is basically the, the left panel is basically the binding energy of the ground state, and the uh, the, the 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 right panel is basically the uh, actually how the B depends on um a max if we tune B such that the uh, mass gap between um MJ one and MJ zero states are the same. Okay. Uh, however, this is not yet uh the end of the story. So the um then we have another truncation parameter which is longitudinal momentum uh, truncation parameter K. So we found that even uh, at specific k, the results seemingly uh, to converge with the max. But as k increases, again we uh, observe divergence. So again, so in this uh, curve, it's basically the the it's like uh, um, um, actually it's rather quickly. So basically, the the, um, the 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 green triangle is without mass counter term. Then with a sector dependent renormalization, we bring it back to um, uh, the blue blue dot, and then. Um, uh, uh, blue, sorry, blue, uh, bringing it to a yellow dot, and then implementing um, this, uh, um, uh, let's say, rotational symmetry by tuning B, uh, we, we uh, let's say, reach the blue dots. So it's still, still, all of them are still, let's say, quite rather strongly uh, diverge with respect to longitudinal parameter K. So, uh, so we basically, all, again, investigate the situation. We found that um, this probably, our conjecture is, is probably due to like the fact that as um, k increases, actually the the uh, um, the wave function somehow is um, uh, drifting away from the convergence in terms of the in terms of the basis. So as uh, for example, if the k is too large, we uh, we observe uh, like uh, the 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 the, the wave function. We need a lot of let's say harmonic oscillator basis states to um, support the wave function, which means to be typically the the actually the the scale of the basis doesn't match the scale of the the bound state. So, so we basically our uh, solution is we again we restrict k in the following way that we only uh, adopt the results with k such that um, um, the 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 scale of the basis matches best matches the scale of the bound state. Basically, in the harmonic oscillator basis, we calculate the uh, probability of the basis um, uh, in the in the in the solution eigen solution of the polytronium of um, projected on the several largest let's say the harmonic oscillator basis quantum number so so which means if if the the scale of the bounce is matches the scale of the basis then um the the harmonic oscillator basis is with the largest quantum number should receive least probability because we, we should be able to use the lowest several basis states to support the ground state um polytonium because they are both let's say massively uh, uh, structured is they are say, like a like like a bump so um if the scale uh, of the basis matches the scale of the bound state then we don't need, in principle, we don't, we don't need those very high up um, harmonic oscillator basis states to support it. So, so by this, uh, uh, by using this kind of, uh, we call it the PN, to minimizing PN, the, the, the probability taken by high, several high, let's say, um, harmonic oscillator basis states in the, in the truncation, we can basically find the optimal K. So, 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 so that these uh, two scales, basis scale matches the bound state scale. So we only work with this, this um, Rather, let's say convergent, um, uh, let's say wave function, and then simultaneously take into account of the rotational symmetry. So, with both this procedure, we actually can get the results um, quite decent results. Actually, we only limited uh, our calculation in those. Uh, this is the, uh, this example uh, with MX32 and K123 because for, we are uh, calculating 100 uh, well, our physical uh, coupling. So we can imagine that the wave function is in the longitudinal direction is mostly that's surrounded in this um, one half, uh, half, half, half partition between electron and the positron. So we need a rather larger key to resolve the peak structure. So this is basically the uh, re results. We basically uh, finish the tuning. 
So we can see that the MG0 and the MG1, they, they are basically um, um, uh, matches. And also we use, um, we use the optimal key, which um, minimize the probability um, that the, the ground state wave function projected on the basis of the prob probability taken by the uh, several highest bases with largest quantum number. Uh, let's say, uh, re remember our basis states are commonly oscillated basis with the quantum number N and M, N being the uh, radial excitation quantum number. So we we, we minimize those uh, high up basis states. Um, so we, we then uh, what we did is basically we make an extrapolation. We only, for each max, we, the procedures for each max, we find the optimal K. And then um, we find the optimal B by tuning the, um, let's say, mass gap between MG0 and MG1 state, making, I mean, essentially making it uh, rotationally symmetric. So then we find, uh, we, we found that basically after this extrapol uh, extrapolation, we get, uh, with, all, with all those procedures uh, per performed, we got quite a decent results, I mean, considering these uh, numerical challenges. So basically uh, for ground the polytonium with physical coupling, uh, our extrapolated re re results is basically um, uh, this value, one, uh, minus 1.59. And this non-relativistic prediction is uh, minus 1.33. So there are still uh, some dis uh, discrepancy, but we can see this rather satisfactory because it's a smaller, very small number compared to the scale of this problem, which is uh, Fermi mass. And the extrapolation function we use a standard, uh, let's say, formula you are used in low energy nuclear physics, uh, extrapolating the binding energy of, um, um, let's say, nuclei. So uh, we also uh, start this. Uh, um, um, the hyperfine splitting between the lowest, the single state and triple state. This is a little bit um, worse, but again, this hyperfine splitting is um, at a much smaller scale. It's like uh, our result is like uh, extrapolates like uh, four times uh, 10 to minus nine uh, um, electron mass. And this is basically uh, the non relativistic uh, prediction is basically um, like uh, one times, uh, it's four times larger, but again, it's, uh, it's on a tiny scale. Um, so uh, with this setup, we can also. Uh, uh, start, uh, study the, um, um, we can also study the uh, wave function. So basically in, this, uh, in, the, in the leading fog sector, we have the wave function in both fog sectors. In the leading fog sector, the, 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 the upper one is the, the singlet, the ground state singlet. We can see that uh, uh, because of this um, uh, relativistic nature, we are starting from um, QED Hamiltonian. So it, uh, the wave function automatically carries the subleading spin structure, which is, I think, uh, uh, spin up up. Uh, spin, I think the, 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 the traditionally in low in, in non-relativistic calculation, uh, the singlet has a spin structure up down minus down up, but uh, we automatically have this uh, subleading component, which looks like a P wave. Actually, this is a, very interesting. It's a P wave S wave uh, mixture, and also uh, for the lowest uh, triplet state, um, the, the the as expected, the dominant component, which is uh, up down plus down up. This is a little bit of, let's say faint. Um, uh, actually, we, it also uh, has the um, subleading component, component, but in this case, it's a D wave. It's a D wave, so <clears throat> it's a it's agrees it agrees with our expectation. Like uh, uh, when we consider relativity of quantum field theory, so even ground state shows um, a lot of non-trivial uh, structure. It's like uh, this is uh, uh, this is not let's say surprising because we know that the ground state proton, ground state meson, they also exist in a lot of uh, highly non-trivial structure in terms of spin uh, space. Um, okay, so um, we also uh, uh, study uh, because uh, just by binding energy alone is not enough to see, uh, to perform the let's say, sanity check. That's the experience uh, uh, obtained from low energy nuclear physics. Usually, um, if we get both simultaneously binding energy and the radius correct, it's a much better, let's say, um, uh, demonstration of the, let's say, the, the situation of non perturbative uh, method. So we also calculate the charge radius uh, by the standard, um, uh, let's say, uh, formula on light front. So um, it's ac actually, it's also very challenging because we are, our uh, basis is designed for strong interaction, not for QED interaction, which typically, in which typically the wave function has a um, long tail. So we also, again, use the same uh, extrapolation function we used when we make an extrapolation. Our extrapolated results, again, is uh, very comparable with the non-relativistic uh, prediction. So this is basically, uh, uh, I just want to report. Oh, by the way, I, I, this is the final slide between, I think between the conclusion. It's like, uh, um, since uh, one of the, uh, let's say the, the motivation or the advantage 
uh, advantages of this approach is because it al allows us to access the photon co elastic content in the positronium. Because uh, we know that positronium is uh, bound by um, the electron and the proton exchange of photon. Uh, however, uh, in most uh, uh, non relativistic approaches, we, we lose or, or integrate out of the photon degrees freedom. But here, we are allowed to, uh, let's say, study the photon, let's say, structure. Here, we calculated the proton distribution function of the uh, bare electron or bare photon inside the positronium. So the, the, the proper curve is the, um, the PDF of the electron inside the positronium. So we can, as expected, we basically, we uh, have, a, let's say, a sharp peak around 0.5 because it's mostly a symmetric, um, uh, symmetric system between positron and electron. But the symmetry is a little bit broken because of the existing of the photon emission. It's, I can think of it as a little bit like a, um, a little bit higher upscale. So, and the, 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 uh, the red curve is the photon distribution. So basically it uh, has a peak in a small X uh, region and also has a kind of step structure uh, at 0.5. This is understandable because the photon is uh, kind of emitted by the electron or positron. So if the electron and the positron are mostly sitting at 0.5, so we can expect there's a step structure around X 0.5. And the, uh, because this is essentially a still, we are using a relativistic approach to solving essentially non-relativistic non system. So we can ex expect that the leading fog sector is still, in this basis truncation is still, uh, the probability is still more than 99%. So which means uh, the traditional, that is also self-consistent uh, in the sense that the traditional non-relativistic approach should uh, be good. And the, the, all, all the relativistic effects can be treated as perturbation. The, uh, perturbation. Um, yeah, this is uh, a summary. So, so basically, um, the takeaway message from this exercise is basically, uh, so first of all, this um, um, the QED system is very challenging because it's uh, so the bound state uh, information is so sensitive on the boundary of truncation. So we, uh, we have to uh, implement uh, sector dependent realization to, in some sense, um, uh, to better, in some sense, trick the computer into thinking that it works in an infinite power of fog sectors to compensate for the uh, basis um, uh, truncation effects. And however, we found that this, uh, uh, the sector dependent realization in this case seems not enough to eliminate all the divergences uh, in bound state in gauge theory like uh, QED. So, so it helps a lot, but not enough. Um, so we, we found that uh, uh, like uh, with fog sector truncation, the UV cutoff in the momentum space of each fog sector cannot be separately um, taken to infinity. Somehow, um, the, the momentum space truncation is correlated with the fog sector truncation. If you have fog sector truncation, you have basically, you don't have the complete freedom um, in, in pushing momentum, sorry, in pushing momentum space, um, uh, let's say truncation. And uh, one of the way to regulate or to uh, make uh, establish a connection between fog sector truncation and optimal truncation uh, in momentum space is by observing a rotational symmetry. So, so only choose the truncation which are compatible with the rotational symmetry. Uh, we found that it can give um, let's say, re uh, relatively comparatively reasonable results. So basically, um, yeah, so that's, the, that, that's all. So basically this is, um, we think that we, uh, at least from this exercise, we uh, can identify a practical way to perform um, uh, balance the calculation on light front in a non perturbatively in a truncated basis. So this may provide some guidance um, uh, for future uh, application in QCD. Okay, that's all. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, it's a very nice analysis. Uh, so yeah, Zhang may you have a question. So the, the divergence you you show as a function of n max and k is valid for the triplet and for the singlet or not? Can Yes. Can you show the picture of, uh, as a function of n max? No, but here I don't see if it is. Uh, yeah. You have two states: the singlet and the triplet. Yeah. This this curve is what is the triplet? Because if, if we solve that using either light front equations sure. or beta sub beta, yes. the kernels for the zero minus yeah. those doesn't need any form factor. 
So they should be stable as a function, while the kernel for the triplet is singular and you, you need a form factor to stabilize. So I, I would expect that the, the zero minus is a stable as a function, no? Then I don't understand the reason of this. Yes. I think it's a uh, rotation symmetry is uh, okay. broken somehow. Yeah. Very nice talk, Jingbo. Um, I have a question on sector dependent renormalization. If I have ordinary QED and perturbation theory, you know, I have BPHZ and I can absorb basically all of the singularities in three parameters essentially. Right. And now you're doing Hamiltonian and you're doing non perturbative, which is very different. But right. is there some sense in the sector dependent renormalization that you can still basically? You know, absorb all the infinity somehow in three numbers or something. Is there enough yeah. rigidity there? Yeah. Oh, right. Um, we thought about and try to uh, uh, try some effort in this direction, but so far we cannot do that. Somehow, my gut feeling, or could, I could be wrong, but my gut feeling is, um, in this, uh, in the real sense, let's say, bond states like polytonium, um. Those some some truncation uh, parameters are also kind of determined uh, dynamically. So you can only determine this after solving the eigenvalue problem, not before. So because it is um, some rotational symmetry is dynamic on that front. Yeah. So, uh, okay, of course. Okay, Shimbo, thank you for the talk. Uh, I was wondering if that method from Hans Christian Pauli of iterated resolvents. So putting your uh, uh, electron, positron, photon, uh, FOC component, just in the valence, reducing everything to the valence. Maybe you recompose the self-energy. Is it something that Wayne uh, was looking? And maybe you can uh, control better the divergence because you are recomposing some of the probably covariant uh, uh, loops. No, if you use this method by Hans Christian Paul, iterated has of it, maybe. Right. Right. The, the, the things, one, one of the things we, um, I, um, yeah, that, that's probably in some sense a more economical way to do it. But uh, because um, one of the ideas basically driving this direction is, first of all, we want to uh, get cl as, as closer to first, pr first principles as possible so that this uh, calculation can be used as kind of a uh, baseline. For the like uh, what you proposed um, the calculation because one of the things is this resonance you, you have basically kind of um, those kind of loops of um, energy energy denominators right so there there are all, always ambiguity in choosing the let's say the energy of the energy denominator because in, that in principle is that if I understand the correctly is that it should be an iterative process basically to determine the the the, the, the kind of resolvent parameter in this uh, energy denominator but sometimes uh, let's say in, in a, it's, it's a numerical uh, numerically tricky tricky process. But we can discuss, yeah. Uh, can your numerical results depend on the choice of basis? For example, if you would choose not harmonic oscillator <coughs> basis, but for example, spline basis, I think it would be instructive to compare. Uh, for two-body problem, it's uh, yeah. rather simple. Right, in, in, in principle, but still, uh, you can see that it's a very challenging because the, the biggest challenge is um, we have to use, uh, uh, currently we use a single particle basis. In that case, we have to use a sing, uh, relative basis because uh, the spline basis cannot exactly factor, factorize out center of, center of mass motion. So we have to rewrite everything into relative basis. You know, but in, spline basis in relative coordinates. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that could be done. Yeah, that, that could be done and could... Uh, uh, useful to compare right. and right. produce the but, same results in basis. Yeah, right. But the practical issue is like uh, it takes a students less a lot of time. I think it's uh, it's very costly in terms of uh, let's say grant money. So, so this is um, um, a practical issue. <laughs> yeah, in principle, I, can, I understand it can be done. Okay. Any other comments? Comments or questions? Okay. Uh, thank you to uh, Dingo. Thank you. Okay, the next talk is uh, Tamir Sarafin about uh, another talk for Positronium.
Um, so I will also talk about positronium, but uh, in slightly different context, although uh, I will still use basis light front quantization to um, um, to solve the solve the system numerically. Uh, this uh, the idea here is that to combine two methods, uh, one method is uh, uh, called renormalization group procedure for effective particles. RGPEP in short, and uh, and also the second method, basis light from quantization. Um, so, um, uh, Shingo Zhao already um, motivated use of positronium as a test ground for for uh, numerical methods and for theoretical uh, methods. So I don't have to repeat this part. Um, um why uh, why would we want to combine those two methods rgpep and blfq um rgpep um is supposed to uh, deliver is supposed to give a um, well defined theory uh um, um i mean uh, this method solves the problem of renormalization and of divergences um, while BLFQ should provide the framework for the numerical um, calculations in this uh, to solve this, to solve, for example, positronium um, uh, system. Also, RGPEP, uh, in principle, should improve the, um, let's say, it should decrease the cost of, of, of those numerical calculations by, um, uh, in a way that, um, Smaller bases uh, uh, should be needed. I mean, should suffice to to get um, good results. So I will start with uh, with uh, out with um, with RGPEP. Um, now uh, I study positronium, so so I I have this Hamiltonian density of Q, QED. However, um, to this Hamiltonian density, I add some uh, term which gives uh, photon energy, I mean, photon mass. Um, uh, this way, the P minus of the of photon actually has this parameter mg squared here. And the um, motivation here is that since mg is non zero, then Small x divergences, which arise when p plus goes to zero, uh, are also in the UV region because when p plus goes to zero, then p minus also has to go. Uh, then p minus has to go to infinity. So this this is ultraviolet region, and uh, since there are both UV and and small x divergences in the light, in in the front form, uh, then um dealing with them we, we because of this mg we can deal with both of them uh simultaneously now uh another thing is that um interactions need to be re regular regularized so in this kind of vertex we introduce regulating factors of this form uh where um P and Q are the let's say outgoing energies of the those two particles, and K is the ingoing one. And this is squared, and TR is the parameter. When TR goes to zero, we remove the regularization. Um, now I mentioned uh, divergences. If we just take the this uh, canonical um, um, Hamiltonian density we will get divergent observables. So in actual, actual uh, Hamiltonian needs some counter terms. And the way we can get those counter terms by means of RGPEP is that we recal rec recalculate this initial Hamiltonian uh, into an effective one. And, and then, uh, this effective Hamiltonian is computed in such a way that um, 
um, that no divergence uh, should occur once uh, we ensure that the effective Hamiltonian has finite matrix elements. So we can first take the initial Hamiltonian, calculate the effective one, compute the matrix elements of this effective Hamiltonian, and then we will discover that some of the matrix elements have some divergences, UV divergences. And then it is uh, quite clear what to do. We can um, supplement this initial Hamiltonian with some counter term. Uh, and we we have to do it as as long as possible until all of the I mean as long as necessary until all the matrix elements are finite. And uh, this way, uh, so if matrix elements are finite when the regularization is removed, which means exactly this limit TR going to zero, then we can just perform this limit and we will obtain a renormalized Hamiltonian, which depends on this now a scale parameter T and the uh, photon mass, which was introduced uh, um, to regularize small x divergences. Now, um, the effective Hamiltonian is uh, computed using uh, concept of effective particles. And effective particle for some scale T is defined as through a creation of um, operator, which is uh, unitarily transformed from the bare part, bare operator B is the bare one and BT is the effective one. And due to um, and dimensional analysis uh, tells us that this T has a dimension of P plus squared divided by lambda, uh, which has a moment mass. Uh, um, mass dimension to the fourth power. This is basically P minus two power minus two. Now, and, and this uh, this step here that I wrote, oh, that you go from the initial to the effective one in terms of Hamiltonians is in practice this, that we express um, the same object, the same, let's say, mathematical operator in terms of different uh, creation and annihilation operators. It's a basically change of basis. Now, um, uh, in practice, we do not actually define this unitary operator T, but we take the Hamiltonian, effective Hamiltonian, and we write an equation, which is a flow equation, Wegener-like equation, and uh, we can uh, go back to the to the um, we, we can calculate the unitary operator if we need to or if you want to uh, so the picture is this the initial hamiltonian in the initial hamiltonian the matrix of this hamiltonian is has non zero entries everywhere um but in the effective Hamiltonian, the only non-zero entries should be close to the diagonal under the condition that the states are um, ordered um, in a way that P, 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 P minus of the state is increasing in this direction or in, or in, uh, or in this direction. Uh, so as you can see, the matrix should become uh, narrower that that's why the um, resources necessary may become uh, um, smaller uh, in practice uh, this transformation uh, is very difficult to compute uh, analytically or precisely so we adopt um extra uh, no um approximation uh, we expand this effective Hamiltonian in powers of coupling constant and the, in this case I will need only those three terms the first three terms in this expansion um, okay so now this general method is used to um, 
to obtain the effective Hamiltonian in positronium for positronium. So in this, the, the first row, he would represent the full uh, Hamiltonian of QED and uh, actually the eigenvalue problem for this Hamiltonian with E plus, E minus, and E plus, E minus gamma states. Now up to G squared, up to second order in the coupling constant, we don't need to consider other um, box sectors. One thing which is uh, um, forced, let's say by hand, is that uh, we do not include here single gamma sector, but this is uh, um, this is simply because the method is support is uh, developed with QCD in mind. Not so, and in QCD we would not need sector with one gluon. Now we, we, in this reduced uh, Again, value problem. We can still uh, integrate out this higher Fox sector and obtain an uh, eigenvalue equation in in Fox sector with only e plus and e minus. And this uh, effective Hamiltonian, this eigenvalue equation looks like this. We have the kinetic energy, and we have interaction, and this is the eigenvalue. Now. Interaction contains two terms, UC, which is basically like Coulomb interaction because this F is in the non-relativistic limit, F is basically one minus Q vectors uh, square, where Q would be the uh, trans uh, transfer of momentum between electron and positron. positron. Um, with the with the uh, new addition of this form factor ft here so this is not not uh, the usual column but with a form factor uh, the interaction is, is smeared um, over some uh, uh, I mean, we interpret this as electron having some finite size in the, uh, 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 when concerned uh, when interactions are concerned. And then there is the second term, uh, UX, uh, which has a one over Q plus squared um, singularity. And uh, due to the singularity, we actually have to find another term, counter term uh, in, in this uh, interaction. But this is, um, so th this counter term we found uh, by calculating matrix elements of this effective Hamiltonian and then ensuring that they are finite. So this, this is one of the examples of, of those counter terms here. Now, mm, okay, so now about BLFQ, I don't have to probably repeat much uh, because we had a few talks, but what I will need uh, is the fact that in BLFQ we have this n max truncation parameter. When n max goes to infinity, the basis uh, goes to infinity. I mean, the dimension of this basis grows. And then this transverse harmonic oscillator basis has a characteristic scale parameter called B. Um, so these are two important points about K. We have I introduced actually there is one K which is uh, usual in BLFQ. Uh, uh, but since positronium is very narrow in X space in the longitudinal momentum, uh, then we do not actually need to keep all of the states. Uh, Let's say if x is close to zero, then this uh, this state will not will uh, will give ne negligible um, contribution. So I introduce a parameter k n, and, and this is the example. If I have k nine and k n equal nine, then I have all nine states, all nine possible uh, momentum states uh, of electron. Let's say. 
But if I decrease this KN to three, then I take only three out of those nine. Uh, and I, I, I choose only those centered around the middle so that my longitudinal moment are uh, equally um, divided between electron and positron. And also there is this slight helicity of the state, uh, which I will also, uh, which will be used. Uh, now, about the positronium, I take alpha equal 1 over 137. As I mentioned, no annihilation channel. And in this system, you have characteristic momentum, which is Bohr momentum. So, I mean, I would call it Bohr momentum, which is half electron mass times alpha. Characteristic energy is 1 fourth m times alpha squared. So I will present results for not the mass, but for the, for the energy, which is shifted by two electron masses and divided by this uh, characteristic energy or Rydberg binding energy, let's say. Um, so E is uh, actually um, dimensionless. And we expect that the spectrum will be 1 over n squared, negative 1 over n squared. When n goes from 1 to infinity is a, a um, natural number. And there are corrections of order alpha square, which gives some hyperfine splittings uh, and so on. Now, numerically, it is it is quite challenging because uh, as you can see, the mass, which is actually what we have in the computer, we do not have, we do not have this E, but we, uh, but in computer, we actually have M. So we, in the computer, we have to uh, take care of many digits. And uh, uh, the red one is the digit which is cannot be trusted because double precision numbers in computer are um, cannot contain this much information. And then the blue ones are, or actually the black digits are the digits that are needed to distinguish between states that are hyperfine uh, split, let's say single triplet. So those numbers are all the same up to these two numbers. So we need at least this accuracy to distinguish hyperfine splitting. In my calculation, I actually kept up uh, digits. Uh, I mean, all of the, let's say, um, precision parameters that tell the numerical algorithm when to stop, they are given such uh, values that the numerical values should be uh, precise up to this point where the underlining stops. But actually, this was a bit maybe too uh, um, optimistic because in the end, I actually uh, ended up, uh, let's say, at this point where, where you have this space. Uh, so. But this is still good because if we look at this E, this means that uh, we have a, a roughly 1% uh, accuracy of the binding energy. And the hyperfine splitting here is 10 to minus 5. Uh, so it's very small. Now, there are some uh, numerical issues. First, I mentioned that we need this parameter B. And we actually need two parameters or maybe more. But for the ground state, we can we can choose some values of n max k and so on, and then change b. And then we know that uh, the energies, uh, I mean, uh, for this parameter b, there exists a variational principle, which tells us that we should look for the minimum of, of the ground state energy to find some optimal b. And in, in this case of, of this second, let's say, band, uh, this is not probably minimal because it seems to go down, but we, we princip variational principle just requires stationary points. And this is, uh, so I choose these points for, for this n equal to band and n equal one is this value. Now, so what happens when we increase n max? This is what happens. Um, as you can see, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, it seems like there is some uh, that it converges to some value, but you do not know exactly what this value is. So 
my idea is that I can look not at the values of this of the masses, but actually on the differences between different points. So here I have several points like like one, two, three, four, and so on. So this let's call them steps. And here the step between step one and zero, let's say, is difference one, and between two and one is difference two. So I plot those d's, and I find that I can do it on a logarithmic scale, and it's it looks more or less like this when when the x scale is n max. So I find some approximation for those differences, uh, which is uh, some power low in n max, and I can feed those parameters a and p. But now, since I know something about those differences, I could try to sum all of those differences up to infinity and obtain some extrapolation. And this extrapolation uh, involves some zeta function. Uh, and this is what I get it, um, when I do those extrapolations for each. Uh, so actually, the, um, no. Now those those extrapolations actually depend on m. So let's say we take step fourth step, and then we sum all of the differences from that step forward. So for each step, we can actually obtain different extrapolation. And uh, so here, those higher points are exactly the numerical masses that we get from calculation. Then those points connected with dashed lines are points that are extrapolated based on this data function approximation. And then I have some lower bound, which also involves data, but I change parameter p so that it should not give some an approximation, but rather a bound, a lower bound for those uh, extrapolated masses. Now, uh, so as you can see, um, okay, so now the idea is, okay, let's say we want 1% accuracy, so if you want to be closer than 1% from the actual value, extra, let's say infinite, infinitely extrapolated value, then we should be somewhere here. This point is already below 10 to minus 2, so we can take this and max actually, and we don't need to take too large and max. I mean, if we want, let's say, 10 to minus 3 accuracy, then we may need to and max, which is larger, like this would be probably 20. Eight or something. One thing that maybe is interesting is that this is also okay. I didn't uh, mention this, but uh, say, but this line represents the the absolute value of hyperfine splitting. So if we want to um, have accuracy or let's say have a mass which is closer than to the true value than the hyperfine splitting. Uh, in terms of distance, then it's uh, then we should actually have some some we can say that and max should be somewhere here. But <clears throat> this is also this hyperfine splitting value mass, and we can see that already here this is n max equal 48, this is 40, uh, 52. So this, it seems like the difference between the masses in 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 single step are smaller than than hyperfine splittings. For n max 52, let's say, but if you look at this extrapolations, 52 is here, and it's still not good enough to be close to the extrapolated value. So it seems like, even though the difference between when we increase n max may be already smaller than hyperfine splitting, say, but but the it doesn't mean that the true value is actually within hyperfine splitting range. And another thing one can notice is that. Actually, if you want to increase accuracy by one order, then it looks like we need to double the n max. Maybe it's not very visible because of those numbers, but if you look at it carefully, if you want to go from 1% to 1 tenth percent, you need to increase n max by two. And if you want to go to 10 minus four, then you need to n max times two again. So it will be like 64 or something. And we can do also the same with with this parameter kn. This kn, what it gives is basically 
the larger Kn, the, the largest maximal longitudinal momentum in the rest frame of electron is. So here the convergence looks much better than in the previous case because it's very flat here. And I did similar analysis, but this time not with dm, but with with the assumption that those differences uh, behave like um, it's geometric series. Uh, so I also, maybe I will not go to, through the details here, but I also have some uh, um, um, this uh, uncertainty analysis. And here again, the top dots are, are the numerical masses, then the, we have the extrapolation mass, uh, values. And, and I can find that uh, to get um, I think this point, I use this point, which is below 10 to minus two. So it, so the value of, of the binding energy should be within 1% of the true, again, of the true uh, value or for if I keep states which have range up to more or less four Bohr momenta. Um, and this can be seen on this plot that I, uh, why is this is the case because these are PDFs of the electron and uh, this is on X but the 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 right end is roughly four point let's say two Bohr momenta so if I keep just those states then I will have this kind of PDFs so you, you can see that after some let's say two Bohr momenta, which is roughly here, it's indistinguishable from zero. But still, I, I mean, you still need it if you want to do like very high precision, I don't know, 10 to minus four or something. And the last one is the K, which is the most difficult one uh, because it doesn't look like it has a nice convergence pattern. So, uh, so it's uh, difficult to find any kind of e extrapolation in this case but if we just restrict to one percent accuracy then we can just keep this point one percent is roughly between those outer blue lines and this actually seems to be within the, the let's say some extrapolation when using very large k seems to be within those those um, um, those bounds. Uh, so, okay. Now the last parameter is this photon mass. And it, this is the dependence of the ground state mass on this parameter uh, mg. And it looks like this, but there is some problem here because it doesn't go to minus one, the expected value actually, uh, but it seems to diverge. Now, I think this is because uh, we don't have enough resolution uh, because the to get this one actually one has in the numerical calculation there are some cancellations and there are some terms which are calculated precisely while the other parameters while the other let's say matrix elements are not cannot be computed that precisely because of the limitation in the resolution in the longitudinal momentum and this cannot be helped only by increasing k and if we increase k this is the increasing direction it it seems to be uh, looking better but the point is that if one should not take too small mg because then you will go into this numerical issue uh, but if you stay safe from from this this problem you can uh, you can do some extrapolations here a parabola fit to those five points gives result very close to minus one the expected value these are so those re residues of the fit which are on the 0.1 uh, percent not not larger than this so so the actual extrapolation um, uncertainty is roughly like this below sub percent 
but I didn't, but there are no extrapolations here. So I didn't do any extrapolations, but I, my analysis show, uh, tells me that I still should be within 1% due to those extrapolations of the actual numerical limit. And this is the result. The, um, for for the spectrum. Um, this this is the extrapolation for mg going to zero uh, is on this plot. And and max is 16, k is almost 6,000, and this kn is 91. So out of those 6,000 points, I only keep 91. And I get, uh, and I computed n equal one, n equal two bands, and visually it looks quite good, more or less within 1, 0.01 e, let's, uh, oh, um, on this e scale. And this is the helicity states for different. Uh, now, if we zoom into those two, uh, two regions, this N1 on the bottom and N equal to on top, it, show, it looks, it's, so first of all, the top one, it doesn't look good because those all, all those states should be indistinguishable on this uh, on this scale. So so the, this this splitting is much too large. Um, the hyperfine splitting, on the other hand, is a little bit too small. You will see in a moment. But uh, the um, order of magnitude is actually very good, and surprisingly, the rotational symmetry is very good because so it looks like those states are are actually the same with precision better than uh, hyperfine splitting. And this is more surprising if you consider that these points are actually actually extrapolations. These are not taken from one, let's say, single uh, calculation, but these are extrapolations in, in this MG. Uh, Okay, and the last slide with the results is this. Where, uh, I have this scale parameter lambda, and uh, and this is how it depends. Uh, the energy depends. The binding energy of the ground state depends on this parameter. Uh, these five lines are the are values for different mg photon mass, and then this line is the extrapolation. So you can see this is very good, and here it depends somehow it it vanishes, and the hyperfine splitting is also stable for large um, scales, but then it go it decreases, which is expected, uh, and roughly the let's say the boundary between those two regions is maybe some uh, some tens of Bohr momentum, uh, already for uh, scale Bohr momentum. This is very, very, the effect of this form factor is very, very strong. Uh, so, so this BLFQ framework is set up for calculations with RGPF interactions and, uh, and, and this calculation is an elementary test of, of this, of these uh, RGPF interactions. And um, we have some control of extra, of, of, on those uncertainties. So we can, uh, Go ahead and apply this method in heavy core Konya in QCD. Thank you. Thank you very much for the detailed analysis. Uh, any comments and questions? Uh, you have shown corrections to uh, singlet and uh, uh, and tri triplet binding energy of positronium. Um, they are of uh, alpha square and something like that. But um, in the case of spinless particles, the correction, um, which is uh, alpha log alpha, logarithmic corrections, I think that it would be interesting to reproduce these corrections also by your method. It should exist, and it should, uh, I think you should show that it appears in your method. So, thanks. This will be remarkable. Thank you. Uh, yeah, this this is a very interesting suggestion. Any other comment questions? 
you use the same uh, truncation and a mutunin that Chimbo before in the previous talk. He has this ultraviolet divergence. You don't have the infrared because you regulate the, the you give the mass to the photo. But I'm very surprised at the stability you got. Because in principle, the two calculations, I mean, if should be equivalent, Shimbu and yours. And you are able to take care of the ultraviolet divergence. And I, I didn't got the miracle. I don't know if it is just because you squeeze with the Wagner transformation, you're a Newtonian along the diagonal and in some way the ultraviolet modes <laughs> went uh, disappeared. So I, I, if you could uh, just give some naive uh, understanding. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I mean, um, once the Hamiltonian is renormalized, there should be no ultraviolet divergences and uh, you can do it order by order. So in each step there should be no problem with that and this is exactly because of this squeezing and in uh, in practice this means this is uh, done by this form factor here so the problem ultraviolet problem here is that there is some direct delta potential which is divergent non-perturbatively and uh, so it's basically constant function in momentum space but this form factor will give some uh, decaying function for this but there is one uh, one thing that I should mention is that the, the previous work uh, is done in two Fox sectors which is much different than this one because here I have only one Fox sector so uh, you can expect some more problems with if you include two Fox sectors Basically, what the Camille said is true because uh, in a in a two focus setup, uh, setup, you have the explicit truncation on the photon level, so that, that will typically lead to that is more severe breaking of um, symmetry or related issue. Yeah, yeah but uh, also another let's say remark is that I think it, using this RGPEP interaction should improve the things somewhat. I, I, it's, I mean, it should be checked. <laughs> So it's very interesting that uh, it depends on how you do it. <laughs> it gets all right. Uh, you have oh here is okay. Uh, I think how uh, oh Yang, can you uh, just uh, speak up? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. yes we can um, hear okay. Uh, great. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Camille, for this uh, very interesting talk. I have a I have a question on the method uh, you use. In principle, the uh, RGPEP effective Hamiltonian gives you uh, uh, a, a second quantized uh, effective vertices that acting on the full Hilbert space, meaning that you could have infinite number of uh, particles, electrons and photons, for example. Uh, but now you are working with uh, uh, only a two-body uh, valence Fox actor. And there must be something that you do to, you know, to obtain a another effective Hamiltonian from the full, you know, second quantized, uh, what you also call it, uh, RGPEP effective Hamiltonian, right? Yes. Uh, this is uh, this is this step integrate uh, no, integrate out this higher sector, and this is done using the. Uh, you call it a Kubo Suzuki Lee method. This was also okay. done in, uh, yeah, but you do not need actually similarity. You can just um, do some manipulations with, with the eigenvalue problem, and then you can still obtain, uh, you can also obtain so, some approximation, some effective Hamiltonian here, which is, which has all the nice properties that Hamiltonians usually have. Uh, yeah, so this is this right. is the but in, in this Hamiltonian, um, I, I saw that you have uh incorporated the one photon exchange interaction, 
but do you also incorporate uh, radio tips corrections, uh, things like uh, 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 electron self energy, uh, vertex corrections, and other things, other interactions? Electron self energy is indeed included, but in this, but I mean, the, it is, let's say, in this first and second row, it is there in this HT2 times d squared. But when you go to the single fox sector, the contributions, this contribution is actually vanishes because of um, cancellation between, let's say, this HT2 term and some effective photon exchange which will give you vertex squared. Uh, so th these are present, but not in the final result here. Okay, and uh, also the uh, vertex corrections, uh, the vertex question is also uh, incorporated. Oh, well, and, that, it depends what you mean by vertex correction. I mean, th this is not, this is just a linear, I mean, linear in G, so I could compute more and more corrections in this term, but uh, uh, this is future work. Uh, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, any other question or comment uh, for the, from the remote people? Right. All right. Okay, so everybody cool. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. and. Uh, Thanks uh, for all the speakers today. The speakers of tomorrow morning, please don't forget to send us your talk, okay? By today. I forgot to mention for the Emmanuel, please come here. Emmanuel is going to the Sugar Lob. 